don't hear me? Now? Now? How about now? Now? Could you not hear me through here? Okay. She's not. Okay. Are we ready? Yeah. Okay. Everyone, please rise for a moment of silence, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Pledge of Allegiance to, to, to the, the flag, flag of, of the United States, States of America and, and to the, the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and invisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, all. We have a pretty packed agenda here this evening. Uh, first, the council has your agenda in front of you. Any addition, deletions, or corrections to the agenda as printed? Here, Nana Chair, we move that the agenda be accepted with unanimous consent. We also have minutes coming from the August 25th meeting and September the 8th meeting. Should I have a chance to go through those minutes? Are there any additions, deletions, or corrections to those minutes? Here, Nana Chair, would also move that they be accepted with unanimous consent. Moving on, you have disbursements from October the 20th and October the 27th. Got a chance to review those. Speak with Ms. Lane, our fiscal officer. Do we have any additions, deletions, or corrections to those disbursements? Here and on the chair, we move that they also be accepted with unanimous consent. Okay, moving on, our, we have a proclamation for a pro bono month, October of 2020. And who's here? Uh, Sandy Brown. Pro bono There's Ms. Brown, it's in the hallway. Okay. Come on in, Sandy. Come on. Sandy. Sandy, come on up, have a seat. <laughs> How are you? I'm late, I'm sorry. That's OK. You're right on time, actually. Um, Sandy, you want to tell us a little bit about this, the uh, pro bono month? And then we'll have Madam Secretary go ahead and read the uh, proclamation. Oh, sure. I'm so sorry for being late. Thank you so okay. much. Can you hear me? Yes. Do you like my new hummingbird mask? It looks wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, so we're just grateful to be part of the national celebration of pro bono. And also, it's perfect timing to help support the work that we're doing and also great timing because of the great partnership that we have with the county. So we're thankful to you guys so that we can help more people who are suffering right now. So we're just pleased to have you guys recognize this month and share, get the word out to more people that help is available. And thank you for all that uh, work that you all are doing working with our CARES program trying to make sure that uh, individuals who need legal assistance, whether it be for rental uh, issues or, or homelessness issues can always come to you all for help mm -hmm. and uh, the CARES funding is there to help supplement some of that cost. Yeah, so, thank so thank you as well for doing that. Proclamation for October as Midshore Pro Bono Month. Madam Secretary, would you please read the proclamation? Proclamation October is Midshore Pro Bono Month. Whereas Midshore Pro Bono is a nonprofit organization founded in 2005 by a small group of dedicated and compassionate local judges and attorneys who recognized the overwhelming need for basic civil legal services for low income people. And whereas Midshore Pro Bono was the first regional pro bono organization in Maryland dedicated to connecting private attorneys with the most disenfranchised residents in need of civil legal representation. And whereas Midshore Pro Bono's core values of integrity, service orientation, compassion, professionalism, respect, dignity, and collaboration underwrite its vision for empowering all people on the Eastern Shore to resolve civil legal issues by working hand in hand with local organizations to break down cultural, geographic, and economic barriers to the civil justice system for the area's poorest residents in Eastern Maryland and its satellite offices in Chestertown and Salisbury. And whereas in 2009, the American Bar Association's Standing Committee on Pro Bono and Public Service initiated the annual observance of Pro Bono Week to highlight the increasing need for pro bono services nationally and to honor the work of attorneys who donate their legal services throughout the year. 
And whereas the 2020 National Celebration of Pro Bono takes place the week of October 25th through 31st, 2020, with this year's theme, Rising to Meet the Challenge, Pro Bono Responds to COVID-19. And whereas the state of Maryland has chosen to celebrate po Pro Bono the entire month of October rather than just for one week, providing an even more opportune time to recognize Midshore Pro Bono's outstanding efforts toward making civil legal representation more accessible to those who might otherwise face great difficulty in securing representation. Now, therefore, we, the County Council of Talbot County, in keeping with the State of Maryland and jurisdictions throughout the state, do hereby proclaim the month of October 2020 as Midshore Pro Bono Month in Talbot County and encourage all citizens to join with us in recognizing and reaffirming the importance of pro bono services on a local, state, and national basis. Given under our hands in the Great Seal of Talbot County this 27th day of October in the year of our Lord, 2020. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, is there a motion for the proclamation? I'll, I'll move for move, the proclamation. Moved by Mr. Lesher. Second, second by Mr. Callahan. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Secretary, please call your roll on the proclamation. Mr. Pack? Aye. Mr. Davilio? Aye. Mr. Callahan? Aye. Ms. Price? Aye. Mr. Lesher? Aye. Yeah, I think I even have this for you. I do. So you want to come forward and I'll print, print this to you, Ms. Brown? Thank you for all the work you're doing. I really appreciate it. Yep. Okay. Uh, next, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Frieda Watley, our health officer, giving us an update from the as uh, the Board of Health. And I did prepare slides tonight and Great. make it a little bit easier to hear through the mask. Okay. Do I have the button? Or do you? Okay, you got the button. Let's go then. I wanted to give you just an overview also of all the trends and what's happening. Go ahead. Oh, the muscle trend. This? Yeah. Oh, thank you. I thought you okay. So as of Friday, uh, the big word was that <clears throat> the United States hit 82,670, which had been the highest number since all of this started. As of October 27, globally, there's been 43.6 million cases with 1.15 million deaths. In the U.S., 8.7 million cases, 225,765 deaths. In Maryland, as of today, 141,741 cases. 3,962 deaths, and in Talbot, 646 cases and um, nine deaths. The Eastern Shore has been a hot spot for the past couple of weeks, or a little over. Uh, they're actually, some of the counties going down now, the one that isn't and keeps staying high, highest in the state that we've seen is Dorchester with a 35.8 per 100,000 case rate and according to their health officer it has not been one but just multiple outbreaks this is just to give you a, a picture of the u.s the first peak was the smaller one and then we picked again in around july came back down and now you can see we're going back up again and it's expected that november and december will be even um, higher than the second peak. So what we're doing now in the way of planning is we're really looking at what to expect on the third peak in November, December, especially with that being holiday season and a lot of uh, family and social gatherings. Uh, looking at testing, 
how we can keep that up, contact tracing, hospital surge, and some of the uh, Midwest states, they're already getting close to capacity. Not us, we're doing very well with that. School and classroom instruction is a concern everywhere. Then we're heading into the influenza season with that and COVID that makes the hospitals nervous about surge. Uh, we're also looking at the influenza vaccination. Of course, we're talking about COVID and when that might be available, I'll say a little bit more later. And then about CARES funding, rollover, or any new funding. So we've been doing a very robust testing statewide. Um, all the week, it was almost like 30,000 reported a day. However, today it's 23,000, but that's lower than usual. It's been hitting a good 30,000. And that's supposed to be PCR. That's not supposed to be rapid antigen. So we've asked repeatedly for the state, are you sure this is not some rapid antigen? They say they don't think so, but that's a concern because, as you probably know, the rapid antigen test you can't diagnose a positive on that. You have to do a PCR test to call it a positive case. And the reason is, they're not reliable enough. And if you have it early on and you're, you're not that symptomatic, you often don't have enough viral load so that you'll have a negative test, but you will have the infection. So uh, only those confirmed by PCR are supposed to be positive cases. We looked at the turnaround time. It gets better and it gets worse. Um, the state decided to combine a lot of their testing and go with CIAN labs, C-I-A-N. And that's probably put an overload on them for the past three or four weeks. They've had a four-day turnaround, whereas they used to have a two-day turnaround. So what we're trying to get is everybody a turnaround like 24 to 48 hours, like the University of Maryland system has, and they do the testing at the Chesapeake College, but most of the others are two to three days. Mm -hmm. We don't use the state contract, as now you can go out and contract on your own. We're doing pretty well getting it back in two to three days, definitely better than the CION, which has taken four days. So I just put up also the name of a website where you can go in and log on to Chesapeake College and have your own portal. You can actually go on and find your results there. And then we have moved from, from, from the high school to the Elks Club. So the testing, we expect the demand to increase over November and December. We've seen that the test sites are uh, a little lower that sounds funny if we've had 30,000 tests, but remember there's been a requirement to do a lot of testing in congregate living, mm -hmm. uh, like nursing homes and all, so that's accounted for a lot of the tests also. We're looking at uh, probably, possibly going in with partnerships for the region and at least having a test site on Saturday. Right now we go Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Wall, I, I hate to interrupt you. Parker, her mic's not red. If that's the problem, the, the other ones are. No, but hers is not. Hers is switched off of the push to talk. Okay. So she should, she should be getting. I just want to make sure the community can hear this. Well, and they can't. They're just having some issues hearing you out. Oh, okay. So we're working on it. So can you also hear, can you hear me now? I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, try, try, try that. Is this better? You're going to need to push your button right here. Is this better? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? <laughs> so we're looking at what we can do to possibly have a Saturday clinic. Um, having to wait that many days if you really need a test and get it back makes it difficult. So hopefully. Okay. So hopefully we'll be able to get a Saturday clinic and that will make it um, more continuous, okay? The private providers will be getting the rapid antigen testing. 
uh, what they call point of care because it can be done in the office. Keep in mind, though, that these are only recommended as screening tests and only if you're symptomatic. That's the only time they really help, um, and that tells you that there's a problem in you know, credibility and sensitivity and all because if they're symptomatic and you get a positive, you want to go ahead and start treating it right then like a positive. It is far more positive, likely to be positive than negative. But if it is negative, you don't really know. There's a lot of chance that it could be positive. So that's what those will be used for. We're still hoping for a better molecular test that could be done quicker on site. There's a lot of research going on. Hopefully we'll have it in a few months. We just don't have it now. They're also doing testing on, instead of gowning up and doing all of this to get the nasal swab, about just getting a specimen of saliva and doing a test on that, which decreases your need for the personal protective equipment and, and a lot of effort there. So there's a lot going on. There's even one now that they want to use in airports if it ever pans out. It needs a lot more testing, but you just sort of blow in like a breath analyzer and it has particles of uh, the antigen, the virus. So that would that would be, we've never had a test like that, but that would definitely be great for travelers and things like that, if it was sensitive enough to really pick up the test. So you mean sim the similar to a breathalyzer that they use on the uh -huh. side of the road? Okay. Yeah, now that one I just read about, that okay. one they said no way they'd be close to it before the first of the year. But, you know, we've, we seems like we've been in this forever, mm. but it hasn't been, I mean, the. The research has gone rapidly in a lot of different directions and doing some good stuff. It's just not here yet. Um, and actually, we think we can uh, handle the testing increased demand as long as we're allowed to roll over our care dollars. Most people think we can, um, and hopefully that will happen. Contact tracing, we've had uh, some challenges, and I'm sure you've read about some of them. One of them is just the uh, software that we had to sort of switch over in, in mid-pandemic to, and it's been a little problem, and still we don't get reports out. We have to do them manually. But we're definitely finding that confirmed cases are being much more resistive about naming contacts, uh, where they've been, or any particular event. Um, this is not Hispanics who are, are afraid of being deported. These are actually Caucasians, um, very middle class, um, but if they had a party or something, don't want to talk about it. We're still seeing from our contact tracing statewide that some of the biggest risks are family gatherings and reunions, and private home parties, um, also restaurants and bars. So when it comes to contact tracing, which we had to get additional people, we think we can still do this with rollover CARES dollars if we're allowed to roll over from, from December 31st. Hospital surge here and in Maryland, although our numbers are going up, uh, we still have plenty of capacity left. Uh, that hasn't been a problem. Remember that uh, a lot of these are in younger people, so the hospitalization rate is not as great. What hospitals are more concerned about, as I mentioned earlier, is going into influenza when there's more hospitalizations uh, and pneumonia from that but also with the COVID. And although there's more beds now through the planning that we haven't used the surge beds, uh, the concern is really the staffing for the beds. You can have the beds, but if you don't have the people to care for the patients, then that doesn't help very much. I think we're better prepared for PPE 
the state has mandated that nursing homes and hospitals keep a 60-day supply. Uh, if they do that, even if there is a peak, we think we're going to be pretty good. We also have some put back, and the state also has some put back. I could always be wrong about that if it's a really big surge all across the state, but we're feeling pretty good this time about the PPE. Schools are a big concern right now for lots of reasons. You would like to have the kids back in school with in-classroom instruction. Uh, much of the safety, which many people don't want to recognize, is it doesn't depend just upon the school. It depends on the whole community and how much virus you have spread in the community. I will tell you that across the country and across Maryland, the virus is more in the staff and teachers than it is in the children. Uh, I think they're doing a pretty good job of watching the children and make sure they keep their mask on and stay six feet apart. And so we've got to keep reminding the teachers to do that. But from what some of the, the studies that we've done on the contact tracing, um, they have brought it in from the school, hadn't transmitted in the school, but brought it into the school from having parties uh, where several teachers were there. So our objective as we look at this is how do we keep the virus from spreading within the schools? So if we keep the six foot distance and we keep the mask on everybody, then we've got a good chance even if somebody comes in with the virus. That's very important. If they do the mask and the six foot distancing, a lot of want to know why they can't totally fill up the classroom again. You can't do the six foot dis, and you can only get 14 in our big classrooms if you want to keep them six feet apart. And now if you want to start uh, going back on the recommendations and putting them closer together and not wearing the mask, you're going to see more. If you look at actually the past couple of weeks, uh, and I follow the zero to nine, the uh, 10 to 19 very closely, those are school age, they're not increasing. Um, I think some of them had, they had a higher rate during the summer when they were out with each other. Uh, if you look at the ones 60 and older, uh, we saw an increase there. When I look at our own breakouts we, since September, we've had uh, a significant number in the 60-year-old. 60 and above, I should say, not just 60-year-old. So in the schools, though, we're really looking for when there is transmission in the school. And there's been a lot of concern. If there's one person, why didn't you close that school? Hmm. Well, we're wearing the mask, and we're staying six feet apart, cohorting the class so that there's not a lot of mixing and mingling all because we know the, the virus will come in. We just don't want it to spread within the school. And so far, you know, we've done pretty well. Um, you heard about um, Talbot and, and Caroline closing. They had a lot bigger community spread than we did at the time. And of course, a lot of the misinformation gets to the media and they want to know, well, why don't you close schools? If you go by the guidelines, you know, you want to see that you're transmitting in the schools. Uh, you want to use a, a lot of guidelines, not just, I've got, a, got one positive or two positive in a schoolroom. And as we said, Dorchester has been running 30, 35, 36, while we were running, the highest we got was 13.4, and that made me nervous, and that's per 100,000 population. Uh, we're now down to 8.5. I like that, but you know, we, have, we stayed low at 4.5 for a while. But if you looked at, we averaged, if we averaged three a day, we could stay under the 10. If we average four a day, it's going to be over 10. That's how little it takes in a county this small for your rate to fluctuate. 
Frida. Mm -hmm. Is this working? <laughs> I wanted to ask a question about that. Cases, if there's no additional, am I not working? Keep speaking. Keep speaking. Um, if there's no additional hospitalizations and there's no additional deaths, do they wait that case number? I mean, it's, it's cases per 100,000, but if the, if the hospitalizations and deaths were going up, that's far more troubling than if none of that happens. So is that taken into consideration at all with these numbers? I didn't get all of that, but I think what I got was that the deaths are not going up. They're staying low. And the hospitalizations? And the hospitalizations are not going up here. They are going up in Maryland. So do they take that into consideration? Yes. For example, if a school had, um, if the school was having a, uh, some cases, but we had the number of our cases was a big nursing home breakout. That's not really in the average community, okay? So when we look at that figure that they give us, it's when to start considering. But when they say start considering, it's figure what your community's doing, not what somebody else's. So if you got close to that 13 to 15, which they say you really should consider at 15, should you close, but you had all of the cases of the majority in this business or this nursing home, no, I still wouldn't close them, okay? Um, as I said, we all want the kids to be in school. We want them to be there safely. <clears throat> so we, we should take all of that into consideration and not just one thing, a, a number. And I think that makes it harder for some to understand, but <clears throat> makes it better for the kids. We're starting our vaccine. Uh, we've also been asked to use a new system for ordering even flu vaccine. And we'll also have to use it for the COVID. And you have to have appointments. They send you that much vaccine with just a little bit more. Now, the reason that's not great is that all of us are not good at making appointments. And so we'll show up the day because it became handy that we could go. We hope they send us enough because many times hours that show up without an appointment are far greater than the ones with an appointment. But it has been stated, this is the only way we get the vaccine, so we have to play the game. Talking about the vaccination, and there's been a little bit more discussed in the past um, two or three weeks, there is actual hope of maybe by the end of this year uh, if not then, early January. That would say that the third phase trials go absolutely great without any hitch or problems. There's six candidates, six companies in the U.S. Uh, that the government is helping with the vaccine. For all six of those, instead of the usual way of turning in your information um, after you've completed all the tests, they have an advisory board looking over all six of them at the same time, all data at the same time, deciding when they should stop or look at something okay. Phase one and phase two is primarily to look for are there any safety problems and what should the dose be? Then phase three is to look at how effective is it? Uh, with the first two phases, they've already seen that there is an antibody response produced by the vaccines. And some of them are even more than if you had the infection. And let me clarify that. If you have, it appears a really bad case, you have higher antibodies than it, if you just had a very mild case. So now the third phase is to see if they're really protective and maybe how long. Uh, you can see that if they get something by the 1st of January, though, they're not going to be able to say, you will keep these antibodies for a year, two years, or whatever. That still will have to be determined. 
Of course, with this type of virus, we've already learned, like with the flu, that you don't get the same efficacy that you get with the children's immunization, which like with measles, you can get a 97, 98% uh, protection. They're hoping for the best 50% and will be very blessed if they get 60 to 70% because it's considered we need that to have herd immunity for the infectious status of this virus. Um, the, some of the challenges already that we're trying to prepare for is they'll come in two dose and you can't give one of one and one of the other. You got to make sure that they get this product, that they get the second dose of the same product. Secondly, there's at least one or two of them that have to stay at 175 degrees, that's minus Fahrenheit. Um, most people don't have equipment that can take it that low, so they're just saying you, you use dry ice. But it's put in 90, 900 doses packages, and once you thaw that, you have to use it within 10 days. For that reason, they're looking at small counties like us. We may have to have one hub, and they send that hub, the virus, and then we have to coordinate uh, all of our clinics so we can use at least 900 within that 10-day period. So I mentioned the CARES funding. We're hoping to be able to carry the CARES dollars that we currently have uh, past December 31st till at least uh, June 30th of 2021. If that occurs, we think we can have the money to uh, not in any way um, have a lot left over, but we think we can continue the testing as we're doing, the contact tracing as we're doing. We've got quite a bit of PPE, uh, and we could also, we don't know if we're going to get any dollars for the vaccination in time to gear up. So we could be doing that. We hope to hear after the uh, election. I can't imagine not letting you carry it over, except that <clears throat> some say they will have none left over, so they may want to take from the ones that tried to manage it well mm -hmm. and redivide it, okay? That's, that's our concern. Um, but we would be okay if they'd let us roll over those dollars. Any questions? Well, thank, I'll, I'll, end right with, I'll begin right where you ended regarding um, the CARES funding. So we haven't heard from the state, from DBAM or MDH, whether or not they Thank you. Whether or not those funds can, in fact, be carried over, we're hoping that they will. But We've they asked are. them multiple times. Right. They've given us their best guess, mm -hmm. Jordan Butler, that he thinks they will be. He even says, I don't think we'll ever have anything definite until a little bit later. Um, but that's all I have is a best guess by somebody hiring the finance at the MDH. Okay, because I know on the last call with uh, uh, DBAM, they were you know, talking about making sure that all of the I's were dotted and T's were crossed uh, with the CARES funding to make sure that there was no inappropriate spending being done. Uh, and it sounded like they were um, had other plans if monies were returned back. I would not doubt that. That's, yeah. that's why we're concerned. You know, they talk one time about make sure you've spent all the money. And I'm saying, well, are you going to come back then and tell me I can't continue contact tracing for two or three months because I don't have any money? So I'm going to take the risk that um, they're going to let us roll it over and I'll have enough to do us until maybe there's some additional funding for vaccine uh, come down the road. Dr. Stamp, have you heard anything on your end through FEMA as far as uh, anything from the... So, uh, Mr. Council President, we, we have submitted application to FEMA and it's in process right now. I don't have any definitive uh, response at this point, but we are going through the application process. I hope to know something um, within the next 30 days 
um, as to whether our full request will be answered or not, or whether we have to seek other ways to address things we submitted for, mostly PPE. Mostly PPE. Okay. Any, any other questions of council? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Wadley, a uh, question about the, the intersectionality of, of influenza and, and COVID-19. As you continue to do these testing sites, are we, as influenza comes into Maryland, are you going to have to be administering two tests for one for influenza and one for COVID for anybody yeah. who's symptomatic? In the doctor's office, they have, they usually, because it's a point of care test, um, they usually have so they can do the rapid tests there. And already we're getting into the season where they're doing finding that it's positive flu. Um, makes them feel better, but they still do a COVID test usually. So it already is yes. here. Uh, you could have both. Now the chances go down, okay. So um, the rapid test, uh, we know we've got one machine and a few tests. Where we would use those probably from a health department standpoint is like um, in the school for any positives. Um, excuse me, any, any symptomatics, we would do it. We would then get the PCR test, but we would treat that positive then like a positive um, because it's, it goes, it's a higher likelihood if they're symptomatic and have that positive test. So we may be doing some of those rapid tests in schools if we can get the supplies and all. But we are not doing any of the flu tests. That's usually, that's handled very well in the healthcare system. Thank you. Any other questions? So this was one of the first slides and I, I wanna go back over it real quick just because of the communication problem in the beginning. So with uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas coming up, we had the conversation this morning on the phone and I'll break this bad news to the public, that if somebody goes away for Thanksgiving, they come back, they get the test, they still need to stay home while they're waiting for those results from work. So make sure that you, you take that into consideration when you're looking at your time off, that you have enough yeah. time to stay home for that. Right. Uh, and could you go over, we have two testing sites, we have the Elks and Chesapeake College on two different days. Could you just go mm -hmm. over that? Because that was Monday and Wednesday are Chesapeake. Tuesday and Thursday are the Elks, and then we hope to get um, before November, or sometimes within November, a Saturday site maybe. It's the staffing that's the problem, so if I could pull off an agreement like we had before with the other counties and, and have something centrally here uh, for anybody in the region, uh, once you staff it, it's you like to have it really full. and as much as you can possibly do instead of just, you know, half of what you could do. And how are things going at emergency services? Are you managing there? Uh, yes, Mr. Council President, we are on day 230 of the activation in support of the health department and the community in general. I uh, just want to reassure the community that the Emergency Operations Center conducts our weekly coordination calls where Dr. Wadley briefs everybody in the uh, the group leads in, uh, in certain areas like uh, medical surge capacity, feeding, um, the grant, uh, we go over that. And then uh, every other Tuesday, we still hold a call with the business community. So although things have, um, the number of cases have reduced, we're maintaining the posture of coordination so it exists in case it ramps up. So uh, we, we continue to do our due diligence in support of uh, the community. Thank you. And Dr. Wally, I know you're on both those Tuesday calls and our Wednesday yes. calls. So you're, you're and also we're having a call with all schools oh, uh, at least call. once a week. Mm -hmm. There's school nurses and somebody in their staff um, who's over the health part. That's public and private schools. We had to do that because there were just so many questions. So other than day-to-day uh, -day also answering questions, we have that call and they're gonna start a state call with superintendents and health officers. And I think the first one is this Friday. But the schools, you know, they, they're gonna consume quite a bit of um, health department time. And we think it's important, we don't mind doing it, 
but there's a lot of different for childcare and schools, a lot of questions and I'll come up about what, what well, should we do. Well, let me just say to you in closing, uh, thank you so much. I know over the last 230 days, you've been pulled in, into more directions than you could ever imagine be, to be pulled into. Um, and I know that sometimes it, it, it felt like, uh, you know, the, the whole weight of the county and of the state was on your shoulders. Uh, I just want to say to you, uh, thank you so much for all that you've done. Thank you for your professionalism. Thank you for your patience with us uh, as we work through these difficult times. Um, and and we, uh, we couldn't have asked for a better uh, health officer to work with to get us, to get us through these difficult times. So I just want to say to you publicly that um, you poured your all into making sure that you kept Tarbert County safe. Uh, sometimes your recommendations were listened to, sometimes they weren't. But I think your recommendation was always based on the science uh, that you had in front of you. So I just want to say thank you very much, Dr. Wiley. Thank you. Appreciate you. And stand on a health note. Uh, we have a two presentation of the 2021, the FY21 Senior Care Plan. Uh, Kate Stenton is here with us. Uh, Kate is our community health officer, a uh, nurse supervisor, excuse me, community health, my glasses are fogging up, Kate, I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. She's our community health nurse supervisor here in Talbot County with the health department. Kate, good to see you, I apologize. It's good to see you and thank you for your time this evening. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm here on behalf of Talbot County Health Department to present the fiscal year 21 senior care program plan, uh, which is really, it's a grant that comes down through the Maryland Department of Aging through an aging program directive. It's a partnership um, that we've participated in through our area agency on aging, which is Upper Shore Aging. Uh, the reason for us coming every year like we do is to um, in inform the council and the public about the plan, what the plans are, and also to respectfully ask for their approval for the plan. Um, it's been presented, of course, within the health department to Dr. Wadley, to Linda Webb at Social Services, and to Gary Gunther. And it's really these, this grant is designed to be different in each jurisdiction and each jurisdiction comes up with the plan on how they want to administer the funds. So we, the funds come through Department of Aging to Upper Shore to us and after we get the approval of all entities then we can send that approval up and they'll disperse the grant funds. So that's, that's the, one of the reasons for our visit here. Um, I think I sent a lot of information about the program and the grant, which was, was a lot. So I just want to touch on the key components. Again, it's, it's a great partnership. Um, and we've been, just a little history, we've administered the program this way since um, 1982. We were a pilot program when Department of Aging first decided to come out with this, this type of funding and this type of program. And at that point in time, the grant award was 243000 which was, was pretty good sum of money for a county our size. Um, and we administered it successfully year after year, served a lot of seniors in the community. And in 2014, the funds were reallocated based off of population and, and percentages of people, you know, especially seniors um, at poverty level. And in overnight in one year in 14, our grant dollars um, were cut to $100,000 from 243. So we were worried about how we were gonna serve all these people we had enrolled with, with certain services. At that point in time, we came up with some ideas. We came to the, the council and, and since 2014, I know the county council has approved um, some additional allocation of funds from the health department for this program in the amount of $50,000 and we appreciate that every year. It helps to supplement the loss we took back then. Um, again, this, it's a statewide program. And, and, and the purpose of the program, the main purpose um, through this aging directive is to provide really um, coordinated community-based in-home services for our senior population that are, that are at risk for nursing home placement. So there are um, income guidelines and asset guidelines that are pretty generous because it's meant to serve the people that don't can't get any home-based services or any assistance through any formal services. They're above those poverty level guidelines that might make them eligible for Medicaid and some other programs, but, but they're still greatly in need. 
So that's our target population in Talbot. It tends to, be, tends to be the lower income people, and I have some statistics on that. Um, and some of the funds, can, are also, or the majority of the funds in our case, um, over 60% of the funds, nearly 70, can be used directly for client services. So we can help them purchase services, purchase supplies, um, purchase things like um, they need chore service, personal assistance, medical equipment, medical equipment supplies, medicine co-pays, um, those types of things. So we can actually use funds for that, um, which is, is a great program to have. The eligibility criteria, it is 65 and older, even though Older American Act usually funds 60 and older. This particular program's for 65 and older. And again, um, a typical, the income guideline is, is very generous, um, but with the limitations of the grant funds, there's so many, so, so many people we can serve with this. So we tend to focus on the lower income, highest need folks. And another requirement is that the people we serve have some functional disability which means they are, they're not able to go out and do the things, you know, to, to maybe get a second job or go out or do things. Most of our folks are, are pretty much homebound and have medical or social needs. Um, so the importance of this to us is if we're keeping people out of nursing homes, there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, it's quality of life. It's keeping people at home longer and being active participants in the community. Um, and, you know, most people do not choose to, you know, want to go to a nursing home any earlier than they have to. Um, we obviously value our seniors and value their experience, and, and they're really a backbone of our community, and we'd like to, to keep them in the community as long as possible. The other thing is cost. Um, we, we fill in the gaps with this money, and that's why the money is often called gap-filling money. So if we can fill in the gaps and keep somebody out of a nursing home, let's say for a month, um, Medicaid, the Medicaid rate for a nursing home right now is $206 a day. So you're talking um, roughly you know, $6,600 a month for Medicaid to pay for a month of nursing home. For our maximum amount is, for, is about $500 a month we would support somebody on in the community. So that's an immediate cost savings. So if we can delay or prevent nursing home placement, that's a huge cost savings to the system as well, as well as the quality of life. Um, and again, the program directs us that we can only provide services through this grant um, when they're not available by any other means. So one of the important services that we provide, and I think we do such a good job with, is the case management care coordination. Um, we have dedicated staff that are experienced. We couldn't pull this off without the staff that we have. They're experienced. We have great partnerships in the community. They're connected. They know where to go to get things done. Um, and it's really the case management that a lot of times supports people and not necessarily the incontinence supplies, the emergency response system, and the other things that we provide. Um, it, it's hands-on, home-based. We go to the senior in the community. We don't expect them to come to us. This really isn't a program that we can do well totally teleworking. We have to be out and about and in the homes. Um, it's a voluntary program. Um, and and we get referrals from a multitude of sources and, and quite often it's from um, seniors in the community referring other seniors. Over half of our referrals are, are you know, based on personal referrals from people in the community. They're getting services and tell somebody else about it. Um, one thing that's unique in Talbot, every county designs their program differently. We are one of two to three health departments where the health department is the primary entity that administers the program. And what we've done, which I, I can't take credit for because it happened back in the 80s, but we've, we've merged it with a nursing evaluation program. They call it the AIRS nurses. Their job under MDH is to go out and do home evaluations on seniors and um, make recommendations about, you know, services, what's available, and then they leave. The, the senior care dollars provides for the case management. So when we merge those programs, we already have nurses going out, doing the evaluations. Well, now they can stay. They don't have to hand the client off to another entity, and they can do the case management. So our clients don't wait for services. We, we, if people are interested in the program and they're eligible, we can sometimes begin services on the day that we visit. 
Um, so that it saves us money um, and it's, it's just smoother for the client. Um, and it's worked well for us, and I think it's why we've been able to serve so many people so effectively. We've, um, we use community health workers from the health department, and we've hired ones that are also certified nurses assistants, so they can, they can do direct care under nursing supervision with the seniors, but they can also help with case management tasks. We have, we have lists of people that want to apply for homeowners tax credits, MEEP, renters tax credits. We, we can help them do that through the community health workers and our staff. So we, we really look at medical needs and social needs, and I think we're really a good model for a true health hub because of that. The nurses can coordinate with physicians, making sure that uh, appointments are made. Uh, during COVID, we've done a lot of assistance with um, you know, tele-appointments, helping people connect with their physicians. So I really think we have a great mesh of dealing with medical and social needs. Uh, we don't, in this county, we've never had a wait list for enrollment in services. Many counties have large wait lists because of the way they're designed, in my opinion. Um, again, the participation is voluntary. Um, one thing to mention, no, no program or service, no program that I know of can meet everybody's need. Even this is just gap filling. We don't operate alone. We have fantastic partners in Talbot County. Our formal partners, like Department of Aging and Social Services, are definitely partners that share cases and um, discuss how to, how to make things happen. And I just wanted to mention a few of the other local partners that are of huge help to our clients and, and assist. Um, St. Vincent de Paul, um, Mitchell Pro Bono that was here earlier, um, Union Dorcas, uh, Society of Talbot, St. Mark's United Methodist Church, Maryland Community for Life, um, Talbot is another Department of Aging uh, program that we work with. Um, Partners in Care who's merging with them. Bay 100 Community Volunteers is huge in helping our people get access. Uh, and they, they work with us, they know us, they know the staff, they know if we refer to them that we've kind of put some process in place. We know about the client, we know about the situation and, and, and we work well with them. Um, when we do referrals, the, the good thing about this program, we can follow people long term for, for case management. We just don't say, you know, contact this person and you can get this done. We stay with them and make sure the contact's made. How can we facilitate it? What can we do to help? We make sure the connections are made so they can get the services. Um, and just briefly, um, I think an important thing to note in 2019, there was about eight, eight and a half million dollars in grant money from Department of Aging was allocated for this program statewide. And there were 4,120 participants. We only received 1.3% of this budget in Talbot, but we served over 5% of the people served. So I think that has to do not only with um, the program design, the staff, but also the county contribution and our partner contribution. And that's how we, we maximize what we have. The, the county, uh, the Department of Aging grant this year is $115,000. So it did go up a little bit. We, uh, last year we served 213 individuals in the program, um, which was a record for us. And we're finding we're going up about three to 5% um, as far as people calling and asking for assistance. Um, so a quick breakdown um, about 62% of our funds last year went to those gap filling funds to purchase services and supplies. About 30% went to case management staff and 8% were um, spent on administrative costs. Uh, our population, another, I think an important thing to mention is um, of the people we serve, almost two thirds are living on a fixed income of less than $1,500 a month. So, that's, you can kind of get a picture of, of who we serve. And 42% uh, are living on a fixed income of 1,100 or less a month. Uh, we're finding um, a lot of um, our seniors are eligible for formal programs they weren't aware of, like um, some of the low income Medicare, the QMB and the SLIMB Medicare plans that pay for the cost of their Medicare Part B. Um, if they don't, if they're not enrolled, once we enroll them, that saves them 100, $135 a month. So those are the type of things we look for to maximize um, what they're eligible for 
and, and just help support them in the community. Mm -hmm. um, I think I mentioned the services. Uh, and again, I just can't, I gotta credit the, the staff. We've got nurses, community health outreach workers, a social worker and a unit secretary. And they're extremely dedicated. Um, we just did our first formal survey to our clients. We sent out uh, 168 uh, surveys, just asking them to rate five different areas of their satisfaction with the program. Um, we got a 61% return rate, which was pretty good, and 98% um, said they were satisfied or very satisfied overall. Uh, so that was that was a good reflection on, I think, the work the staff is doing. Um, during COVID, just to, just to kind of toot their horn again, is that um, we, at the beginning, we had to limit home visits due to lack of PPE. Um, we were limited and the PPE needed to go to more urgent areas. But we still went out, um, we made phone calls to our clients every day, our phones were open for them to call. We did grocery shopping, we tracked um, during the time of March through May alone, the, the staff made 402 home visits just to check on people, deliver supplies, that sort of thing. Um, and as in June, once the PPE was more available, we, we geared up and we were back in the households when clients wanted us to. We found it a very interesting mix of, um, you know, some, some people wanted us to come, were lonely, they wanted us in there. Some had family members that were um, able to stay with them and provide services and they really didn't need us as much. We had family members that had to be quarantined and said, can you, can you go check on my parents or grandparents more often? So we kind of got a mix of requests. Um, so we did a lot of meal and grocery shopping, assisting the county groups that were running food banks and food delivery, we assisted them. Um, and I think staff did really a heroic job of going out there and um, supporting vulnerable folks in the community. Uh, moving forward, I think our worries are that our, the numbers served are going up. Um, our support money is pretty much staying the same. We worry about um, that we're not filling in the gaps enough in certain situations to help support people and keep them out of nursing homes and, and keep them safe. Um, again, we, due to the limitations of our financial resources, we spend most of our time and funds on the highest risk cases and uh, with the lowest income seniors who have high medical needs. Um, and just another important note that we're not really just supporting the seniors, we're supporting their caregivers. We, want, we don't want people to have to leave their jobs or limit their jobs or stay home if they don't have to, if we can find some support for their vulnerable um, senior family members. We know um, that you know, the numbers of seniors are, are growing. Um, the, the statistics we have that nearly 30%, well right now 30% of the population in Talbot is roughly 65 and older. And the statistics show that about one in five by the year 2030 will be 65 and older. And we want people to stay healthy. We, we do a lot of preventative work, chronic disease management, but we also have a need today to support some of the folks that are especially vulnerable. So that's pretty much what we do with the program. Um, again, you know, the, the staff really make it happen. The additional support we get from the county um, definitely um, makes us be able to serve the number of people that we serve. So I wanna thank you for that and just, um, you know, respectfully request that you review and um, approve the plan so we can get our grant disbursement and move on. Well, Kate, actually, thank you very much for the presentation, but the thanks actually goes back to you and to your staff. You're um, making uh, much to do with the little that you have. Um, and when you look at that, you're, uh, you're only receiving less than one and a half percent of the total state allocation for this program, but you're serving 5% of those participants, um, that kind of goes against the narrative that Tarver County is this big wealthy place and we have a bunch of money and nobody's um, doing poorly uh, and nobody's in need and everybody's just skipping around and dancing around and having fun. That, that's not the true narrative. Um, we do have a senior population who are greatly at need and I think that um, what you and your um, other workers are doing is meeting them at the level of that need, in the home, 
Absolutely. So they won't have to travel and risk falls and anything of that nature. So um, the thanks goes to you and to your staff for just doing a marvelous job. Any additional comments before I ask for a vote on the senior plan? Look, as the, the rep representative from the uh, Commission on Aging, I, I would like to just say that I greatly appreciate you showing up tonight and going through this report. Uh, this is where the transportation workshop came out of, that discussion with the Commission on Aging. Um, just hearing about seniors needing rides to doctors and, and needing more cab services in town. Uh, I, yes, we do have an aging population that I, I, it's very important for them to stay in their homes. And I greatly appreciate everything that you're doing to make sure that they're comfortable and safe in their homes, yet still have access to all of the, the other great benefits that we have, the senior centers, the, the YMCA's, the other activities that we have for seniors and, and the community. So thank you very much. Mr. Pack, just yes. quickly, yes. two quick points. Number one, and I've said it before, Kate Stenson is one of the health department rock stars. It is absolutely <laughs> amazing what she does. Number two, with your support, I'd like to work with Dr. Wadley to see if we should add this issue to the meeting with the local delegation, the issue being the state share of funding. We certainly know the history of how it's basically dried up and gone down by, 100, by 50%, yeah. but there may be an argument based on our senior population of starting to look at that number and moving it up. I think the point added to the agenda, I, I would agree with that as well. Thank you. There's no further comment. Uh, again, and Kate, you are a rock star. Thank you very much for, for all that you do. We certainly appreciate it. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion for approval of the FR21 Senior Care Plan by Mr. Callahan. Second. By Mr. DeVillio. Any further comment? If not, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Mr. Pack? Aye. Mr. DeVillio? Aye. Mr. Callahan? Aye. Ms. Price? Aye. Mr. Lesher? Aye. Thank you, Kate, very much. Thank you all so much for appreciate your time. It. Appreciate it. Susan, can I sign that over here? Oh, I did. Okay. okay, Council, we now have a numbered, res numbered <coughs> resolution for introduction. And Madam Secretary, when you're prepared, I'll ask you to read the resolution. A resolution authorizing the transfer of a portion of Glenwood Avenue in as is condition to the town of Easton by quick claim deed for no monetary consideration. Thank you. Mr. Cooper Smith, did you want to speak to this before introduction or? I'm, I'm happy to. Okay. Uh, and you want to give Ms. Cooper Smith that mic? There you go. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pack. Sure. This resolution is the result of a request from the town of Easton for the county to convey a portion of Glenwood Avenue. The area in question is located between the bypass and the Treadavon River. And this section of road is in the vicinity where the footbridge is that crosses, the new footbridge that crosses over the Treadavon River to reach Easton Village. And so the town of Easton has requested that the county introduce legislation to authorize the conveyance of the roadway to the town. It would be no monetary consideration as is condition, meaning that the county would not be improving the road before giving it to the town. The town would accept it as is. Mm -hmm. Attached to the resolution, there is an exhibit that shows in detail the area in question, a survey that was done by a licensed surveyor of the roadway, and then there's a legal description. Okay. And, and where the, thank you, Mr. Cooper Smith. And where the road currently sits, uh, it's uh, currently already in the town, just that that road is still um, county uh, property. So it, it makes sense to uh, go ahead and convey that over to them. Any, uh, any additional uh, question of Mr. Cooper Smith on the resolution? I don't, we don't have anyone from the town here, I don't think, so, okay. Mr. President, I'm yes. sorry for the interruption. Ms. Moran correctly is pointing out, we're trying to be prepared when you introduce it, which I think you will, as to a public hearing date. Yes. The month of November has your second meeting in the week of Thanksgiving. Normally you would move that up a week. 
I'm not, I was not prepared to do this till the end of the meeting, but it impacts the scheduling of things right now. Uh, so I think I'm going to, I'm asking the council to quickly just consider instead of meeting on November 24th, which is the Tuesday of Thanksgiving week, could we, would the council be willing to entertain the 17th, Tuesday the 17th as a special legislative day? Okay, I know we don't like to pull our count, calendars out. Eh? And I apologize. I, I understand, Mr. Mr. Hollis, but uh, we certainly understand the... Uh, Mr. Peck, I would support the change of date. Thank you very much, Mr. Lesher. I appreciate it. Would you also, Mr. Callahan, would you, Mr. DeVille, I know you'd like to pull your count, your count out, would you look at it, please? The 17th, we have back-to-back -back meetings that month. Yeah. Is that okay? Could you do it? Okay, we're all in agreement. So we're going to have, uh, Madam Secretary, the 17th as the second legislative day for the month of November and not do a meeting on the 24th of November. I think you should, yes. Thank you. So we're just going to get it straight now. Um, so let me go back. Nobody here from the town on this, correct? Okay. So, um, Madam Secretary, would you call the roll for introduction so that those who are maybe tuning in um, hear it? Mr. Pack? Aye. Mr. Devilio? Introduction. Yeah, instead of, instead of showing your hands so people can hear you. Okay. Yes. Aye. Mr. Callahan? Aye. Ms. Price? Aye. Mr. Lesher? Aye. Okay. And the number, Madam Secretary, of the resolution? This will be known as resolution number 297. 297. Are you going to try to put it on that new date once we get that cleared up? Yes, and the public hearing will be on um, Tuesday, December 8th. You want to move? I think we're going to move it up now. Hold on. <clears throat> okay, December 8th. We're going with that date. Okay. Council, your public hearing will be on December the 8th. So uh, we'll let the town know in case anyone from the town wants to be here for that. Yeah, go ahead. Mr. Cooper Smith, I got I, I have one question. So it, it says in the resolution it's a portion of, of Glenwood. Okay. There there's there's two other streets to go off from that. So it, is that are we are we sort of giving that to the town too? So those those streets that come off of this section of Glenwood, the county does not own and maintain those. I, I believe those are owned or, and maintained by the town, but they, they may be private cul-de-sacs or driveways. But it's a good question. And the section of roadway that we're talking about conveying is just just the main section of Glenwood Avenue. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, I, think, okay, I think one goes to East yeah. Facility property back there. So Mr. Edwards is confirming that neither, neither of those roads are county maintained. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we um, December 8th for that public hearing. Um, we do have several matters for a public uh, hearing tonight. I know it's past 630 as always. Um, these are all interrelated, Madam Secretary. What I'm considering you do is if you read the title to each resolution and then uh, persons can come up and be heard on either um, of the three resolutions. Well, I will take the well, the fourth one is a bill, so yeah. So that's still three the th three three resolutions, please. Resolution number two ninety three, a resolution to amend the Talbot County Comprehensive Water and Sewer Plan to reclassify and remap residential real property located on Ferry Bridge Road, Easton, Maryland two one six zero one, described as Tax Map twenty four, parcels sixty nine seventy and one ninety one from unprogrammed to S1 immediate priority status. Resolution number 294, a resolution to amend the Talbot County Comprehensive Water and Sewer Plan to approve a capital project for the improvements associated with Talbot County Resolution 235. Resolution number 295, 
a resolution to amend the Talbot County Comprehensive Water and Sewer Plan, Resolution 204, a resolution to add a capital project to upgrade the Talbot County Biosolids Facility at 9786 Klondike Road, Tax Map 18, Parcel 57, to add receiving and treatment capability for brown grease equipped with odor control proposed for FY 2014 with funding in the amount of $6 million through Rural Utility Service Program, USDA Rural Development. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Before I turn this over to the public for their comment, does any member of staff wish to be heard on either? Mr. Clark, please. Uh, yes, Ms. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Pack. what we have right now is that for Resolution 293 as well as 294 and 295, we need to present these to the uh, Planning Commission mm -hmm. on, uh, as well as the Public Works Advisory Board on November 4th. Okay. So I request, if we can, to keep the, um, I guess, the public uh, meeting or, or yes. hearing mm -hmm. open until the, your all's next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Anything for any other members of staff? Uh, just, just a question. The, the first of these, Resolution 293, the one that concerns Ferry Bridge Road, I understand these are fairly small lots in, a, I think, the RC zone. So programming these as S1 is not going to facilitate any new dwelling units in that. I mean, no. it's already as subdivided as it ever will be able to be. We won't be adding more units. This will simply be changing units that are already on septics and, and put them onto the, that is correct. onto the sewer pipe that flows from Unionville. Correct. And they, basically we have three, let's say, existing improved uh, structures that uh, ultimately that would be three EDUs or three sewer allocations. But that's a good point, Mr. Lesher. So these are, these are not new lots. New, new yeah, there would be no new lots. No new lots. Okay. If no one, no one else from staff, I'll start on my left then. If anyone wish to be heard on the resolution 293, 294, 295, come up, give us your, your name and which resolution you want to speak on. <clears throat> and anyone, I'll move to the right side of, of the room. Anyone on the right side of the room wish to be heard on, on any of the resolutions, please come up and give your name and be heard. Mr. Showwater, good to see you. Thank you, President Pack, members of the council. Uh, for the record, I'm Ryan Showalter, 100 Northwest Street, Easton, Maryland. And I'm appearing uh, on behalf of the applicants and property owners that are the subject of resolution number 293. Um, as the, the brief dialogue by Mr. Uh, Clark and Mr. Lesher indicated, these uh, three properties that are the subject of this amendment request are already improved by existing dwellings. Um, one of them is located on the point at the end of Ferry Bridge Road. It has a septic system that is seven or eight years old. It replaced essentially a dry well. Um, the health department approved its replacement as a, uh, a repair, but because that property is uh, almost entirely encumbered by the 100-foot buffer, the, the replacement septic system is located in the buffer, and the property owner would like to uh, go from a five-bedroom house to four, consolidate and reduce the number of bedrooms into a small addition to connect a detached garage. We've been working for several years, and the health department will not permit modifications to the house even to eliminate a bedroom. Uh, the second house has a septic system that was constructed, we believe, sometime in the 70s. Uh, it's a constrained lot. It has buffer uh, impacts. And the third lot, uh, the leg property, has a septic tank that is... Uh, pumped on a regular basis, and also it's a constrained parcel. So uh, having the ability to connect those three lots uh, to the county system will take that wastewater out of the buffer and, and out of uh, you know, immediate proximity of the Miles River and allow it to be treated properly. It won't facilitate any new houses or additional development, but it would permit you know, investment in the existing residences that are uh, there. We'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much for your comments. Appreciate it, Ryan. Thank you. Anyone else wish to be heard on any of the uh, resolutions? Okay. Uh, Council, as you heard from Mr. Clark, uh, these matters <coughs> are on the agenda uh, for the Public Works Advisory Board for our November the 4th meeting, as well as Planning Commission also meeting November the 4th. So uh, 
I will ask that we can either close the public hearing or keep it open until after. Uh, what's the date? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. We do have. I do apologize. You have a caller for the uh, public hearing? We do have one caller on the line. Caller, if you're interested in speaking, please press asterisk three on your phone. No, okay. Um, we could either leave this public hearing open through next, uh, next Friday uh, again, we won't hear back from the uh, either commission until our second uh, second uh, Tuesday in November, or we can go ahead and close the public meeting he hearing now. I, I don't think you're going to garnish a lot of comment if you just go ahead and close it now, but I'll leave it open for discussion. Okay, very well. Public uh, hearing on both on all three resolutions are closed as of now. Uh, council will wait to hear back from the commissions. And well, Madam Secretary, I guess we can pick this back up at our November 10th meeting then. Okay. Yeah, commissions will be heard by then. Yes, they'll be eligible for vote on November 10th. Okay, so we'll pick this back up at our November 10th meeting and we'll get the report back from those commissions at those times as well. Okay, thank you, Mr. Clark. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, next matter we have up for a public hearing is a bill. This is Bill 1467. Madam Secretary, would you please read the bill? <clears throat> Bill number 1464, a bill to amend Chapter 172 of the Talbot County Code, Taxation, to authorize the creation of special taxing districts in Talbot County for the purpose of installing, maintaining, and operating street lighting along county roads. And when such improvements are approved by the Maryland Department of Transportation State Highway Administration along state highways within Talbot County. Thank you very much, Madam Secretary. Uh, I'll start again on my left side of the room. Anyone on the left side of the room wish to be heard on Bill 1464? Come up, give your name, and be heard. <clears throat> Anyone on the right side of the room wish to be heard on Bill 1464? Please come up, give your name, and be heard. Mr. Dorm, I'll turn to you. Or do we have any callers who wish to be heard on Bill 1464? Okay, thank you. Uh, this matter can be brought, brought before the council at this time for third reader uh, for council to take action on it this evening. Uh, the chair will entertain if there's a motion to do so at this time. So moved. moved by Mr. Callahan. Second. Second by Mr. Lesher. Any further discussion on moving the matter before council for third reader? Just that this is, this is I, th I think, an important, uh, an important bill to resolve and uh, an unresolved funding issue for street lighting down in Tillman. This is to create a, a you know, this, this had been paid for uh, for a number of years by the Tillman Fire Company. Uh, they, they cried uncle on this uh, and, and the county intervened as an emergency measure, but we need to find a long-term means of maintaining those, those street lights. And, uh, and this is the solution that we're looking at. So uh, I, I'm, I'm appreciative that, uh, that we're able to move this forward now. Thank you for it, Mr. And, I, and, and, I, and let me just add to that, you know, and it, and it wasn't like this council has been uh, not trying to resolve this matter through other means. Uh, we went to SHA and asked State Highway if they would take the lights. Uh, they um, pretty much declined. Uh, we went to Delmarva, is it Delmarva? Delmarva, and, and asked them if they would uh, assume responsibility to the lights, which they declined. Um, they are doing some improvements on the lights, uh, putting in the LED. Uh, which will um, hopefully bring down the actual monthly uh, uh, cost or wattage of, 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 those, of those lights. But uh, so we have not just been sitting around trying to find a way to push uh, another taxing district onto to the citizens. We have been actively trying to figure out a way to uh, get these lights conveyed over to uh, another party. Uh, these were not lights that the county put in place, to your point, Mr. Lesher. Uh, these were actually put in place by private entities. Uh, the citizens down there were anting up once, uh, I guess once a month, once a year, uh, to pay for the lights. Um, people move, people come, people go. The bill doesn't get paid. Um, 
and uh, we stepped in over the last two fiscal years to, to pay the bill. But um, we, we need to find a long-term solution to keep those lights on and maybe to provide uh, additional lighting uh, down in, in that uh, part of the county at a, at a future date. So um, I'm happy to support this bill. Um, I know we still got some additional work to do down in that area for, to, to garner support for it, and I, and I hope that the citizens will realize the importance of keeping those lights on in Tillman. Uh, so with that being said, we had, I didn't write my notes, who made the motion? You, Ms. Kelly, was that you? And a second with Mr. Lesher. No further discussion. This is the move to second reader. If there's no further, the third reader, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, third reader. This is to move the matter to third reader. Um, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Mr. Pack? Aye. Mr. Davilio? Aye. Mr. Callahan? Aye. Ms. Price? Aye. Mr. Lesher? Aye. Bill 1464 is now before Council for Third Reader. Madam Secretary, would you please read the bill? Bill number 1464. I ask that so much be considered a reading. Any objection to Ms. Price's motion? Okay. Uh, bill 1464 is now before Council for final vote. Is there any further discussion on Bill 1464? Hearing on Madam Secretary, um, again, I think we, we've already spoke uh, quite extensively to, to the, the meaning for this, this particular bill. Uh, if there's no further discussion, I ask the Madam Secretary to call, call the matter for vote. Mr. Pack? Aye. Mr. Davilio? Aye. Mr. Callahan? Aye. Ms. Price? Aye. Mr. Lesher? Aye. Okay. Thank you. Bill 1646 passes. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Hollis, I'm looking at you. The, the next step was that is, is we're going to have to go down and, and garnish a community meeting on, on this. Right. Your staff's going to develop the options of the district boundaries okay. for the council to look at. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next matter for council is a discussion on the request from the NWCP, the Tobacco County Branch, for a work session with county council members and other community leaders. Um, Madam Secretary, uh, there was a, a letter that Councilor had received. It was, if you wouldn't mind, if you have that in front of you. Read it in its entirety. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, I don't have it. Okay. Um, the letter is from Mr. Richard Potter. Um, good evening, Council President, Mr. Pack, and fellow council members. I, along with other community leaders of Talbot County, are requesting a meeting with you to discuss next steps, as well as how to appropriately move forward, that embraces the spirit of inclusion and equity as it relates to the matter of the Confederate monument known as the Talbot Boys that sits on the Circuit Courthouse lawn. As a result of the decision to retain the Confederate monument on the courthouse lawn, there has been much civil unrest that has prompted community members to protest that will more, more than likely continue until a removal is achieved. It is very unfortunate that this matter and issue has attracted national attention through the New Yorker and other media outlets that have placed Talbot County in a very disparaging light, which has caused me great alarm and concern. The longer it takes for us to act in an inclusive and equitable manner puts us in direct threat put us in direct threat of potentially allowing outside people coming into our county who could set us back negatively in working together to accomplish our desire of inclusion and equity for all constituents of Talbot County. Please note that I do not believe that all people who live outside of Talbot County would potentially cause a negative setback, but more so we as Talbot County citizens could potentially lose control of this matter. It is my desire, along with other community leaders, that we take a proactive approach to this issue and matter. Therefore, we are requesting a meeting with the full council on October 20th, 2020, to have authentic, transparent dialogue on how we can work together as one community to move forward in an effort in achieving a more inclusive, equitable, and welcoming county that we all desire to see. I look forward to hearing from you soon as it relates to our request. Sincerely, Richard M. Potter, President. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And I know subsequent to that, uh, we did get a, a list of those, uh, I guess, persons mentioned or not mentioned in the letter, but referred to in the letter. Uh, and that was 
Mr. Richard Potter, Mr. Richard Potter, President of the uh, Tarver County Chapter of the NAACP, uh, Mr. Walter Black, First Vice President of the Tarver County Chapter of the NAACP, uh, Ms. Megan Cook, President of the Town of Easton Council, uh, Mr. Jim Richardson uh, uh, from the United Unitar Unitarian Universalist Church Social Action Chair, and Ms. Uh, Hannah Paraka uh, from the uh, program of the race thing, or the five citizens that were alluded to in the letter. Uh, Chair, we open up for any comment before we ask for motion on the uh, on the request. No comment? Okay. Well, I would ask for now just a, a vote on the request to move forward to hold a meeting at some, at some date uh, with the members that are listed, uh, the citizens that are listed here uh, to discuss uh, uh, community uh, feelings around not just the Tarboy statute, but again, the other issues facing not just Tarboy County, I think the, the nation as a whole. Uh, I don't think we've met with the NAACP, to my knowledge, as a group since 2015, yeah, since 2015. So uh, it's been five years since they've requested a presence before this council. So uh, I don't think it's something that's, uh, in my opinion, out outrageous to every five years sit down with the group and talk with them. So that's my opinion on it. Any further comment? If not, we'll move to a vote on the, on the request. Again, there's no, uh, the, the, the date mentioned in the letter, of course, is coming gone. So we'll probably have to sit down and figure out another date if this, if it's um, proved, uh, and wish to meet with them. So uh, this is Frank DeVille. I, I, I will not be making a motion on this. I, I appreciate Mr. Potter reaching out to us. Uh, I think that when the council is prepared to set up a work session, I would like to pick the individuals that would like to work with and schedule it at that time if and when we decide to do that. Okay. So so Mr. Mr. I, I think I would agree too. I think all of us are willing to, uh, you know, have a meeting in, in the in the near future. But at this time, I'd, I'd, I'd rather not take a vote yes or no on meeting because we're always open to meetings. So it's just a matter of timing and, and uh, waiting to the appropriate time to meet. Okay. A any other comment on the request to meet with these citizens? Well, clearly the, the, the date has, has passed. Sure. Uh, are, are, sh should we give some indication about, uh, about our intended timing on this? Um, I, again, I think the calendar, we've got to, at, at some point in time, sit down and look at the calendar and see what's open. Um, and of course, due to COVID, we're gonna have to find a location that's gonna be suitable uh, that we can all spread out and meet with. So either at the Y.O. Prom or- so, other, so we can all yeah. admit that this is, this is not usual? Uh, it's not normal that somebody calls up and wants to schedule a work session and chooses the individuals for the work session. Uh, that's probably the reason that there's some problems with this and confusion. Uh, I would and I am working to try to put together a board uh, and I'm working with individuals, some of whom have told me that they don't want to work with some of the individuals who are on this list and they are people of color. So I understand and respect their wishes and I'm continuing to work on this. But at this time, I am not willing to schedule a meeting with Mr. Potter. Okay. Um, well, as far as it being unusual, it's, uh, again, in 2015, when the request was made, we didn't pick the persons who come to meet before us. The council did not pick those persons. Uh, those members were brought in uh, to meet with council, and we heard from them. So we didn't cherry pick who we would, we would meet with. They, they wasn't were brought Because that was the NAACP, right? They came in? That was the request. And this made is by not the just the NAACP. No, there, is, there are two members, but right. there are other members as well. Yes. Yeah. So to your point, it wasn't a council. Yes, pick. Mr. Pack, to my point. It wasn't a council pick group. Correct. Okay. It was the NAACP. This is not the NAACP. Correct? The letter this is, is business. This is, this is somebody, right, who's got a business. Uh, this is somebody from a church. And this is some two members of the NAACP. Again, why, uh, uh, go ahead and let's move forward with the meeting, please. I, I would just clarify to your point, we did not select the, the members we met with the last. Because they were all NAACP members, correct? And that was the NAACP requesting to meet with you. 
That is correct. Okay. That is correct. They were all members of the NWCP. Uh, to, to my knowledge, now, again, that was 2015, uh, the MWAC made the request, but can I stay here, sit here and say definitively that every person sat in that chair, those chairs were from the NWACP? I cannot. I cannot. They made the request, but whether or not all of those members were from the NWACP, I cannot stay here and say that. No. I watched that meeting uh, recently, yeah. and as far as I recall, they were. Yeah. And um, I know that I have continued to speak with many community members, including uh, mem leaders from the faith community. So I would agree at this moment with uh, Mr. Davilio and Mr. Callahan that I'm not ready to move forward with this particular meeting with this particular group. Okay. Anything further from you, Mr. Lesher? I, I, I'm just I'm just not clear on on exactly what the next step is here. Well, the first step would be to uh, to agree to a meeting with the citizens, uh, which it appears that members do not want to meet with these citizens. Uh, and then the next step after that would be to figure out what date and what location we would meet with them. So the first to, step to, to clarify, be, wrong. Yeah. The, so I, I was saying that no, the first step would be if we wanted to accept the letter and the meeting with these individuals. And I've said no. That, that was, would be the first step. I, I was addressing right to Mr. Lesher to his point. The first step would be to agree to so, a meeting. Yes, and, that's the okay, first so step. Okay, so if we aren't right. agreeing, if you have a majority, move forward. I was exp answering Mr. Lesher's question, Mr. Villigo. He was asking what the steps were. I was answer answering his question. Can I do that? Okay, that's what I'm doing. Do you have any further questions, Mr. Lesher? Uh, just, you know, I Look, I, I understand. I understand that the Talbot Boys Monument is, is a highly sensitive issue now, both for proponents and opponents of, of its removal. Um, and I'm interested in doing what we can to advance that conversation. Yeah. Under normal circumstances, I think a request to schedule a workshop would, would seem like a productive way to do this. But in this case, it's clearly being received as, as, a, as a hostile move. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry that we're at this point in our discourse, uh, and I'd like to try to restore a spirit of civility and, and mutual respect uh, around this table, getting through this and, and other thorny issues. And I just want to offer to do what I can to, to try to advance that and, and that, that civil spirit. Uh, I know this is tough, but, uh, but we need to try to work together to do this. Sure. And I do believe that everybody on this council is having conversations and continuing to have conversations and we know that this is not a finished done deal and that we are all, and I know I am personally working on uh, solutions for the future, um, but I'm choosing to do that through individual conversations and I believe that I hear some of the other council members are continuing to have conversations. So I don't want anybody to think that um, we're just digging in and we're not continuing to talk with members of the community and leaders in the community. It's just this particular meeting is not one that we're looking for right now. We want to see through conversations that we're having what uh, individuals we may want to put together or whether we just want to come up with some type of consensus um, privately amongst each other. And at the end of the day, Mr. Pack, I'm following your advice and moving forward with the plans for my the resolution that I put forward and the group of individuals that you cautioned me to work with. Well, that, that's fine, Mr. Villio, uh, to do that. Uh, okay, so it, it appears that the request from, the, from these five citizens uh, is not going to be uh, welcomed by, the, by members of the council at this time. Uh, again, I, Mr. Pack, just one thing. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, sure. Okay, so um, I, I, would, I would like to not use the word not willing. Because I, I think well, how, that's, that's, that's not uh, unwilling. So I, I think the individuals that would actually like to, to meet with us, council, it, 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 might, it might help that the individuals that want to meet with us meet with us individually first so we can work some, you know, some, some, some things out that they might have a problem with us saying, doing, or what our beliefs are. So it, it, it might help that we not, the, the individuals that want to meet with us, meet with us individually. I'm very open, my phone's on, they can call me, I can, you know, sit down with them and, you know, a couple of them. 
you know, it, it doesn't, you know, to start the conversation. But I think that's where you really need to start. We need to arm some things out because there are some things that are offensive to people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, some council members are offended, so it would help that that, that person would not meet and, and sort of do us all at once, so to speak. It would really help that that person reach out to each council member and, and set up their own meeting. And, and so meet with the group, meet with this group individually? Is that what you're suggesting? I, I, all I'm suggesting, I think that would be a way to start the conversation like Mr. Lesher said. So if, you know, um, Megan wants to reach out to me personally from the town and meet with me, I'm, I'm more than willing to do that. You know, and I, and I think it's only appropriate that if we're, if we're all in here sitting and we're all sort of just throwing all these things out at us, mm -hmm. you know, maybe we can work all that stuff out before we get to that point. Well, I, I'll, that's a good suggestion uh, as far as meeting with the group, uh, maybe in pairs. Um, okay. Um, I know Mr. Lesh and I met with uh, Mr. Uh, Potter and Ms. Lombard uh, about three weeks ago, maybe now, three weeks ago. And, and I thought it was a very productive meeting. Uh, we met with the two of them uh, down at the, the Bay Street location. Um, I felt that we, um, we covered uh, some very salient points and we were able to, to reach some, some common understanding uh, with them. Uh, again, it's going to be up to the group. I think that, I mean, if, you know, as far as meeting the payers. Um, I, just, I, just, I just want to be productive. I want to have something that I can talk on a normal professional level in front of the public and not have a bunch of um, things thrown at us. And, and the person that's talking, or us, it gets in heated conversation because this shouldn't be a heated conversation. No, no. It should be a productive conversation. And look, if this conversation lasts part of next year and takes whatever time it takes to get some of these solutions worked out, that, that, that's what Ms. we need Mr. to Callahan, do. Mr. Callahan, I, I will be glad to, to pair up with you uh, to meet with this group if they, if they so choose to. Again, Mr. Lesher and I did. Um, so if, if the group wants to meet with us in pairs, uh, I'll, I'll be glad to, to sit down with you in this group, uh, or Mr. Lesher, whomever. Uh, I think that's an excellent idea, yep. if you want just to just get, yep. get the and, conversation and, and I, and, rolling in pairs. Yeah, and, and, and I, don't, I don't necessarily, you know, and this is no disrespect, I don't necessarily need you to meet I, with I'm just saying, I, I would just offer it up, it, it, it could be you and Mr. It, Lesher, or you what, and Mr. DeVillio. It's, it's, whatever, it's whatever that person wants to reach out to us is comfortable with. And it doesn't have that's to right. be in pairs. We can sit one-on-one -on -one with people. I think that's where you get a lot better conversation when you can sit one-on-one -on -one with someone rather than five people and two people and all of that kind of thing. And I think that's what we have to do. We be, it's a lot easier to clear the air when you tend to talk privately one-on-one um, -on -one with people. And that's what I'm much more interested in doing. Well, you're saying privately, I think Mr. Callahan was in a public meeting, so... And that, each council member can decide for themselves well, how they would wish to meet, whether they want to do it individually uh, or in pairs. We'll, we'll wait to hear back from, um, from whether or not that's something that the group would want to consider. I was just offering up a, 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 as, a, as a way to get uh, two council members at one time, rather than to do five individual meetings, if they did it in pairs, they could, they could uh, not have to rearrange their schedule five different times. So. Uh, it, it worked when Ms. Alesha and I did it. Uh, if, you're, if, you're not, if you're not comfortable with meeting with me in Paris, that, that's fine. I was just offering up as a way not to tax the group so, um, so frequently. Um, okay, so um, I'm still waiting for a motion um, on the request to meet with these citizens uh, at a future date. Is there a motion to do so? Okay. Mr. Pack, I'm still not clear on this. Are, are we, we're not proposing a specific date or time or anything like that at this point. Yeah. I, 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 once again, if they want to contact us, we'll, we'll be willing to meet it individually or in a pair. Let, let them call us, Pete. You, you know, I, I'm, willing, I'm willing to meet. Let's talk individually or in pairs. It doesn't matter. I mean, to this, this set this date thing, is, is, is sort of like running us into a corner and making us do something here. I mean, we're, we're all, you know, we're all adults. Reach out to us. 
And if you want to meet, let's, let's talk about some things. I mean, it's that simple. I don't know whether I cleared it up for you or not, but <laughs> any more clarification? There, there, there is no date set. I think the first, the first step is to either agree to a meeting or not. Mr. Callahan is offering to meet uh, individually or in pairs with, with the group and, and a, as a public setting. So I'm just waiting for a motion to, to, to uh, ask the request as written, as, as presented. Well, as presented. So the, the request as written is, is, is October 20th. Which is, which uh, so is that date on. is passed. So right. uh, ostensibly that is moot. Uh, the, are we at this point simply asking the public to uh, take the initiative on this uh, that, that, that we will not? Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm hearing that we will take some initiative on this and perhaps we can, perhaps we can give some reassurances to the public about what the nature of that initiative would be. Pete, I can't give no more reassurance and tell them to give me a call and I'll meet with them. I, I don't know what else you need. And I haven't had a chance to meet with the board that I need to meet with to discuss about putting together a committee with certain individuals to discuss what I want to do, at which time then I'll bring it back to the council to see if that makes sense. But I, I, I'm sorry, uh, you know, Mrs. Wilson, I'd, I'd love to hear from you and, and speak with you. I saw Mr. Black just the other day and, and, and had a great conversation with him. Uh, it, I just got Richard um, or Jim Richardson's phone number to, to give him a call to sit down with him. Uh, I, and I'm still working on the cell phone tower and, and, and many other things. So yes, there's plenty of individuals in this community that I'm working with regularly on the statue and discussing it. But I, I'm not to this point yet. And, and, and we've already voted. If we were going to have this work session, Mr. Pack had all the time in the world to schedule this in the beginning. But he didn't. This, this was, why, why are you bringing my name into this? Because this, you this, put this on the agenda. This is a request so, made no, no, by Mr. the Pack, you put this on the agenda here. This is a request here. So, made by the NAACP. That you put on the, this agenda. Right. So yes. So, that, that's what I'm, I'm saying is I don't understand the confusion here. I think people are a lot more comfortable, again, talking privately. The minute you put three or more council members together, it all goes on the well, public record. And people yeah. can't be as honest in speaking with one another if you know that it's always recorded, and which is why I keep saying that speaking individually one-on-one, -on -one, I believe, is going to be a lot more productive at this time than putting us in, you know, in front of an audience. And I know I'm much more comfortable speaking that way, and I'm open to anybody calling me to have a conversation. But right now, to put all of us together, I don't believe that it's going to be productive at this time. Okay, anything more, Ms. Alessia, from you before we move on? Okay. Uh, I, I haven't gotten a motion. Uh, you heard the request from Mr. Mr. Callahan to reach out for a, uh, a group meeting with him individually. I will offer that up myself to meet with the group, either with him or without him on pairs. Uh, I'm still open to meet with you publicly uh, at any designated time. I guess we've had to schedule this uh, uh, down the road as far as when. Uh, but I am open as well to meet with the public uh, on this issue or any other issue, uh, and I'll do so publicly. Uh, there's nothing I, I can't say publicly to you that I can say in privately to you, um, and, and, and I mean that. So I don't have to hide behind privacy and veils. Uh, I will say what I mean and mean what I say. And, and um, so I will offer the same thing as Mr. Callahan. If you want to email him, email me for a public meeting uh, with this group, I'll be happy to do so. Happy to do so. Okay. Next matter on the agenda is for a discussion on ballot question B, C, and D. Uh, these matters were introduced by the council last month. They have been printed. They're all on the, uh, on the, on the, the official ballot. I was out at the polling place all day yesterday, well, most of this morning and yesterday as well, with several of the deputies. Uh, and, and, and anecdotally getting good feedback from the public on, on these ballot questions. So I'm, I'm cer certainly hoping that uh, persons understand what the ballot questions are. Uh, they were sent to them in their uh, mailed out ballot to them. Uh, it's also on the website as well as we had Ms. Lane and, and uh, Sheriff Gamble and, uh, and Mr. Stamp do a 
interview with the Talbot spy, and that went out, I believe, Monday of this week as well. So we have many ways for citizens to find out about these ballot questions uh, and what they mean. Um, so um, I know we have all the three principals here. I, I don't know who wants to speak to which one. Ms. Lane, I don't know whether you want to lay voice to, to C, to B, dealing with the constant yield. I mean, we have your interview on, uh, I don't know, any council member wish to speak on these? I mean, we have them already printed. We already have our, our uh, committee that's done, had did an excellent job. Ms. Lane, thank you very much for chairing that committee. Uh, Sheriff Gamble got the word out through a, uh, a piece in the paper, and so did uh, Mr. Stamp. Did, did your piece get published yet, uh, Mr. Lesher? Uh, I believe it did. I believe it just went out today went from out the today. whole council. Okay, so, so Mr. Lesher also had, had a piece that went out. Um, and just FYI to the Star Democrat, who I hope is listening, please, please, because early voting is going on, please try to get this in the paper, printed edition tomorrow, because, you know, so many people are early voting. If, if it doesn't get in until the weekend, you know, there's only one day of voting left. Um, it's, it's really important, and I know we're going to talk more about it, but um, I know the, the letter was written by Mr. Lesher. He did an incredible job on that, so I really appreciate that and allowed us all to sign our names to his um, perfectly written letter. So thank you for doing that. Okay. Any other comment on question B, C, or D? Uh, clarification, Mr. Stamp, you want to offer any, any added words to the question? So Mr. Council President, members of council, as your emergency services director, you know, I clearly have been part of this process and I thank you for your leadership in it. Um, and what I have said is we are at a crossroads when it comes to emergency services right now, and the, the, uh, the voters in this county have to decide what level of service that they expect. And so uh, to, be, to use as few words as I, I can, because this can be somewhat complicated when you go in and you read that, uh, the bottom line is it's very difficult right now to find paramedics and emergency medical technicians. It's a very competitive market for a number of reasons. Um, and uh, it, so we are competing for uh, a very few, of, you know, a, a small resource. That's number one. Number two, uh, we try to achieve a national standard in our response time for advanced life support. And although we achieve that in some areas of the county, there are some areas of the county that we cannot achieve that. And it continues to uh, uh, become more problematic as time goes on. And, and although we're trying to address that through putting on a temporary, what we call surge paramedic unit. The bottom line is that we have to um, add a sixth crew and uh, establish a station on the north end of the county. And of course, without additional funds, it's gonna be very difficult to do that. So we are at a crossroad right now. And with our volunteer fire companies, they work hard. We are very fortunate in this county to have seven very dedicated volunteer fire companies who this county council supports and they need your support. And uh, so this is critical for our volunteer fire companies as well as emergency services. And I know Sheriff, Gam Sheriff Gamble is here and I'm sure he'll speak to his needs as well. Thank you. Ms. Lane, Sheriff Gamble, either you want to speak to any of the ballot questions? You can come up and be heard. Uh, oh, and Susan is here. Susan Bakken from, uh, from our, uh, our commission is also here. Susan, come on up. And again, Angela, thank you very much for, for cheering this, uh, this commission for us. We certainly appreciate it. Okay. No, I don't need to push the button. Okay. Um, the one thing I do want to just stress to the citizens is that if you vote for questions B, C, and D, it will only modify our existing tax cap. It will not eliminate it. Um, Question B will have no financial impact to any citizen if that passes. That's just to clarify language. Question C could have an impact to citizens, um, depending on what CPIU is. Um, for the most part, that's a fairly minor impact. Question D is a greater impact, but you're investing in Talbot County. Now question D only allows for a temporary increase for five years of one cent per year above what we would be allowed under the cap. So for many people, the majority of our citizens um, who have a property assessed at $300,000, 
their impact is $30 a year for that one cent. That's an investment of $150, $150 over the five years. That's really a minor investment in Talbot County and in our public safety, which we all need. Absolutely. But I do want to stress that none of this eliminates our cap. It's just a modification. And the majority of it is a temporary modification. Thank you for putting that out. And um, thank you for, again, for doing the interview as well. Could I, I just wanted to follow up. I um, want to hear from everybody else. But when it says temporary, there was a letter to the editor that I read. And their concern was that, OK, it helps for, you know, and again, it's not definite that we would do it every year for five years. Um, but they said, what happens after that? It's, and it's not that it um, goes back. So let's say we did $30 a year for five years, for $150. At the end of those five years, you stay at that rate. You would still be paying that same rate, the additional $30 a year. It's just not going to go up any higher than that. So for example, if your tax bill is $1,000 a year, I'm just making up a number, or you could tell me what the tax bill is on $300,000. I don't know what it okay. is off the So let's just head. say your tax bill is $1,000 a year, and you've gone up 150 to $1,150. At the end of five years, you don't drop back down to 1000 so I think what the citizens' concern was that wrote a letter was, well, how are you going to then continue to fill that gap of what you've spent? Again, we're not going to go backwards, but the point is that we're not going to continue to increase. So when we talk about this temporary increase of a penny a year for up, up to a penny for up to five years, if you are, have increased another $150, you will continue to pay the extra $150. So it's not like we're going to have to find those funds someplace else. So I hope that that answers that person's question and anybody else um, that, that had that same concern. It's not that we're going to have to find the money someplace else. Um, and one other uh, that I heard was about public safety, and I've heard both, um, especially the sheriff, address this. And it's that while we can't specifically, specifically earmark it for public safety, um, because it all goes into the general fund. I know that I, and I believe the rest of this council, has every intention of taking any additional funds to put towards public safety. By law, we can't earmark it, but that is where I know I plan for it to go, and I believe everybody else you know, has every intention of doing so. So, thank you. Susan, how are you? Thank you for <laughs> Very being Very well, with thank us. you. Thank nice. you for serving on our commission. It was a pleasure to serve with you. Um, I just wanted to add a couple little things to what Angela has said. She has said it extremely well, as well as um, Mr. Stamp and Sheriff Joe have done an excellent job in the presentations. Um, I just wanted to add this piece as both a business owner, business property owner, resident, residential property owner. We have been out and about. We have had multiple um, email blasts and have gotten tremendous amount of response both from individuals I'm sorry this keeps slipping okay. <laughs> um, we've got a tremendous amount of very positive response and it has to do with let's say I have a practice with 2,000 patients a third of them are Medicare meaning they're over 65 these people are extremely anxious about the current situation of our health and safety. And these people, when we explain the very clear increases, are saying, that's nothing. I would more than double that to know that an ambulance was going to get there within that four minutes, or a police officer was going to be available when I need it. So these are the comments that we have gotten back when we have gone out with the information on B, C, and D. So I wanted you to know that we, as part of your taxpayer team, took it to the citizens and are getting favorable responses. And I hope all the others follow up and vote yes on B, C, and D. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Sheriff Campbell, you're back there. Uh, Lincoln, I was on the... Uh... Thank you. Mr. President, um, and just thank you, Council. I know this Council has been uh, committed to uh, trying to get the Sheriff's and the last Council 
um, that I was, uh, when I first got elected, has was, was been committed to trying to get us to where we need to be competitive. Um, and we've made great steps. If you hadn't taken those steps in the last council and this council, I, I'm not quite sure if I could staff patrols right now. Um, so thank you. Um, but we all know, and it's obvious um, to you all because of, you know, the questions B, C, and D, that attracting and retaining good employees, good to great employees, is, is a challenge. And I hope the citizens have, uh, with all the attention that we've given it, actually take, just take a, a few minutes, 17 minutes, I think, was the video that Clay and Angela and I put together. Take 17 minutes out of your day and watch that video and uh, make an educated decision on this because it really is an investment in our community. It's an investment in our safety. Um, uh, this isn't to uh, line the pockets of, uh, this is about young people who are committed to public safety in our community that <clears throat> I think that we owe a uh, reasonable uh, pay rate and a reasonable um, uh, benefit package to in order for them to work 24 7 365 you know nine months ago we were in clay's people were heroes because we were still going to work when everybody else went home um, and i think it's time now for our community to stand behind us i'm confident that this council will use those funds to further our public safety missions and that's been brought up to me before um, and I've told people, I said, I'm very confident that that's where this money will be spent. And I'm glad that Ms. Price brought that up tonight. Um, but uh, I just really encourage the citizens to make an educated decision because we really are at crossroads in both Clay's office and, and my office. We really are, are there. And it's, um, it's going to be, it's difficult now and it's going to be much more difficult six months from now. And I fear a year from now to attract any police officers. Easton Police right now is struggling as well. They're down eight officers right now. Um, and it's going to become more and more and more competitive. And the price is going to go up to have people to police and to respond to your house in medical emergencies um, because young people just aren't um, and we've got to do better as leaders to try to motivate them. But young people aren't applying like they, they did. When I went to the State Police Academy, there were 700 people showed up for 60-some 60, 60 positions. They're barely getting enough people to show up even there to um, fill the positions they have. So anyway, thank you for your support. I hope the citizens take it seriously and do some research. Our number is 822-1020. Ask for me. Well, one of my command staff would be glad to explain and answer questions to members of the public that have questions before they go to the polls or see us at the polls because, you know, some of the deputies off duty, Mr. Pack's been there as well um, to uh, help explain to people and, you know, those things. So thank you very much for your support. Well, thank you, sir, for all that you've done for this effort. Uh, you, were, you were on the, on the committee as well. Thank you for serving as well as Mr. Clamp, uh, Mr. Stamp. Thank you for serving on the committee. And, and, and that's where it started, just getting the people around the table from that committee uh, to give input and to look at the language. Um, this, was, this is not the first time we tried this, as you know. We were successful uh, a time prior. But the committee did a really good job, I think, as being um, open-minded, focusing on what it is that we were attempting to do. Uh, and it, and, it, and it, it wasn't an attempt to, to elevate taxes to, to an extreme level, as, as Ms. Lane said. You're still going to have that tax cap there. You're still going to have that 2%. But removing CPIU will allow us to at least capture the full 2% every single year. And that one cent increase is only a five-year uh, um, five uh, entity, and, and that goes away after that. But it does allow you to do some compounded interest over that five-year period of time. So, um, uh, yeah, and hats off to your, your guys who've been on the polls the last two days when I've been out there and uh, talking with people, allowing us to at least see them face to face and answer their questions. Um, and for the most part, citizens have been uh, very, you know, um, upfront. If they didn't understand, they said, well, explain this one to me. What does C mean? What does B mean? And you just take a moment and walk with them. You know, I've walked right down the sidewalk with them, explaining it to them. So um, I think people are getting it. I'd like to see some of our EMT officers out there, if they can, if they're, if they're not, you know, not working, come out and uh, help out. I think once we get uh, into November 3rd and we now have to 
go out to many locations, I think the more um, hands on deck will be important uh, to, to meet people on November 3rd. At those different Clay's projects. people are signed up, but we have a master sheet that one of the guys is working on off duty, and Clay's got people, folks on that, on that sheet as well to volunteer. Good job. Good job, um, man. I, I do need to give a shout out to Angela, and yeah. um, um, she's done a great job. Um, and Susan has done a, a magnificent job. She's helped to keep us organized and gotten the message out. And uh, yeah, I'm getting emails from her about how we can do better to get the message out. So thank you both for uh, your commitment to public safety and the young people that are serving here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It's in the paper. We have it on, uh, 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 on the internet. Um, we have letters to the editor. So. Yeah, ask questions. If you're out there, ask questions. Yes. So I'd like to give a couple uh, remarks on these questions. Uh, so I had initially asked for this agenda to be kind of cleaned up so that it would just be every vote would be unanimous. You know, we wouldn't be arguing. Um, try to show unanimous support. And obviously that didn't happen. And maybe that's for the best. Everything's for the best, you know. And we're all obviously very different council members with different backgrounds. Uh, different people who follow us, support us, uh, and I hope uh, and believe that we're all for B, C, and D on this. Uh, and so that should go to show to the community as you're thinking to vote, you know, if you're thinking about one of us and all five of us that look different, sound different, and do different things are saying yes, then maybe you should also be thinking yes. Uh, I've received a lot of text messages. I've seen a lot of the, the deputies putting out a lot of great answers to people on social media saying, what, what are these questions? Should I vote? And Mr. Gamble's staff, is, or Sheriff Joe's staff, has been fantastic in supporting these. Um, I absolutely do support the uh, emergency services. Question B for, you know, is just a grammatical clarifying, basically correcting what we're doing. Um, with question C, that is what I always tell everybody, that's the one that put us in the hole. The CPIU, we were never, uh, should, nobody expected CPIU to drop as low as it did. And that's eliminating that prevents us from going back in the hole in future years as we have done. And question D, uh, you know, everybody on social media loves to bring up the trees that are being cut down right now all over the county and what's going on with those? Well, there's a big building out there with a lot of county tenants in there and we're gonna be tearing that down and relocating the sheriff's department for one of those. So it'd certainly be uh, helpful to me, a very conservative, scared to death person, to know that if we needed additional funds for that, for the sheriff's department or for the sheriffs themselves, we would have that ability to do that one time during those five years if we needed to. So uh, when you're thinking about B, C, and D, think about your council and, and what your council is saying to you. Uh, again, we're all very different individuals and I hope that uh, all of us will support these. Thank you. And I, I want to lend my support also to question number A. Uh, it's, not, it's not listed here, I don't know why, but it should also be listed here. You know, we also need to find a way for not just this council, but future councils to not be limited uh, by residency when it comes to uh, the Office of Law and, and the uh, Planning Office uh, to allow uh, future councils to select individuals who are, um, who are appropriate for the job, regardless of residency. Uh, and I think that that's one that I'm also urging citizens to to consider as they're coming out to the polls. Again, I was there yesterday, was there today. I'll probably be there again tomorrow for the rest of the week. Uh, and I will continue asking them to consider that one as well. I think we have to allow not just this council, but future council to select individuals based on their talents and their gifts and not based on their residency. That's very important. Mr. Lesher. Thank you, Mr. Pack. I, I agree precisely on that point. And I, I wanted to get back to questions uh, B, C, and D, and the question about what would this cost? Uh, and I, I did a little bit of, of arithmetic. I had it checked by uh, finance officer Ms. Lane. Uh, and the difference, it, this year, the cap would have been 1.9%, the CPI. The difference between that and the 2%, and keep in mind, the council opted not to raise the property tax this year. So just because the council is empowered to do so does not mean the council will. In fact, we're, to make up for that, we're drawing on reserves. At some point, we've got to make up for that. At some point, we're going to have to replenish those funds that we're, that we're drawing down. We cannot do that indefinitely. You cannot indefinitely spend more 
than you take in. Um, that's, what we're, that's what we're doing this year because we knew this was a tough year. But the difference between that 1.9, had we, had we levied that tax increase and the 2% that we would be allowed under question C, for the median household of $316,000, if your house is assessed at that, this would have meant a difference of just $17, one seven. This is, as, as Mr. Pack said, this is, this is pretty minimal. The penny, as, as Ms. Lane said, is, is certainly, certainly a, a bigger chunk, but even that is not a significant increase. That penny, question D, if enacted, for that same median priced house, and I'm sorry, $326,000 house, the increase would be just $32 this year on top. We're not talking about a significant increase here. The cap would still be a meaningful cap. Talbot County would still have the lowest property taxes in the state under this. This is affordable and it is so important. It is so important for preserving public safety here. It is so important for us to be able to fund our sheriff's deputies and our ambulance services. This is absolutely vital. That is where the gap is, is in public safety. We need your help to do this. Thank you, Mr. Lesher. So, um, I'd like to sure. add something. Um, so I echo everything about um, you know, the, the, the tax questions and I'm, you know, I think everybody knows I'm the most conservative one up here. When I ran 10 years ago, I was like, oh, I'm gonna find the fat and cut that county budget because we were in a really difficult time 10 years ago, and I found that there really wasn't that much. And I think Mr. Hollis was on the council at that time, and it's like, nope, it was, it was, it was pretty lean. And, and I think that the council is conditioned to keep it that way, even if we have some extra funding. Um, but I do, I also want to touch on question A that Mr. Pack touched on. Oh my God, we're going to agree on something tonight. But it's another letter that I read from a citizen that said absolutely not and some of the things I've seen on social media are like no you know that they, they should have to live here they're making decisions for Talbot County I want you to remember a couple of things it's not automatic like the tax increase it's not automatic that um, we certainly will look and um, try to have people that live here fill those roles um, but I can tell you that what happens sometimes if something happens with someone's family. And I can say that that has happened, I, I know, to an employee of, at some point over the last 10 years. They had a family emergency. They needed to live someplace else to help take care of family. What this does is it doesn't say, we're just gonna go out and hire somebody from Queen Anne's County or from Montgomery County. It means that if somebody has an extraordinary circumstance that it gives the council the flexibility. And remember, it requires four-fifths of the council. It only allows the council the flexibility sometimes to have some compassion and to allow that employee, that employee that we value, to do something that makes sense for their life while also having an incredible employee in the county. So it is not automatic. And all we're asking for in question A is to allow four-fifths of the council to have that flexibility when it is absolutely needed. And I believe, as far as me, that would be a pretty high bar for me to say, okay, that's fine, you can live someplace else. It's not that simple. Sometimes people have you know, a spouse and they're living and working in another county and they have to do what makes sense. So just remember, it's not automatic. Again, we're just asking for that flexibility. And if you have questions about that, again, try to contact us and let us know. Um, I hope that the, the Star Democrat and the Talbot Spy and anybody that's out there on social media can also give this one some attention. Let's not focus on the negative things. We've had enough of that. And let's not just, you know, we have to focus on these ballot questions, all four of them because you do elect us to be here to make decisions and we do the best we can for the majority of the citizens. 
So allows flexibility on, on all of these questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Again, uh, to all you, thank you very much for all the John, Susan, uh, Joe, Clay, uh, uh, Angela, thank you. And, and say uh, thanks to the rest of the committee as well, uh, to all the members. Uh, I know that uh, Dr. Griffiths is home recovering from her, her knee surgery. We want to send her our thoughts and prayers as she recovers. But I also want to extend a thank you to her as well uh, for her participation in this group as, uh, as collectively. So um, again, uh, early voters are out there right now, and, and hopefully we can, uh, we can meet them tomorrow at the polls and, and, and keep encar encouraging them to uh, select A, B, C, and D as they're going in and uh, answer any questions they may have and realizing that uh, uh, you know, to stay competitive uh, with our surrounding counties, uh, we know we, we can't even hire engineers right now for Mr. Clark's uh, Department of Public Works. But we've been we've been down an engineer for how many years now, Mount Ray? Two. Two years. Two years. Without an engineer. Come on. We got deputies leaving us, going over to Anne Arundel County and other places. We can't get paramedics. Come on. Come on. We 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 need your help. We need your help. This is this is you, this is you helping you. This is just a vehicle by which to do it. This is you helping you. And, and I will be there uh, again tomorrow morning as answering and any questions face to face. If you have a little to speak with me, I'll be glad to take that on too. But uh, well, let, let's talk about it. All right? Okay. Thank you very much, gentlemen and madams. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Edwards, are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay. Come on up. Madam Secretary, we now have an update uh, regarding the. Uh, the County Repurposing Center. We're going to hear from Warren Edwards, our road <laughs> superintendent. I know he has some updates for council, and uh, Warren, the floor is yours. Good evening. So the uh, second school, they have finished hauling in the um, demolition material. I think they have some more soils left that they're going to bring into us in the next seven to ten days, but uh, we still have in the neighborhood of about 10 or 12,000 tons of concrete to separate and crush at the site, at our site. I did a, had a TAC committee meeting last week and we have a meeting scheduled for November the 4th with the planning commission at 9 a.m. and then November the 16th for the Board of Appeals. Um, there are some issues outstanding. One of them is a concern about the sewer and how to handle that. I talked to Ms. Morris the other day at Environmental Health and Ray Clark, our Public Works. So in the, you have a copy of the prepared budget, I think, in your package from me. And I added uh, the money in there for that if and when we ever get this thing off the ground. But in order to get a final and Mary Kay's here to correct me if I say this wrong. In order to get a final approval, we had to have something in the works on the site plan for the sewer, even if it's not to be done, you know, in six months or a year, but that it's an effective plan that we're working on to do it. So I think, Ray, with the end, December, I think we have to meet in December to get a comprehensive plan for the sewer extension so oh, that, okay. that's kind of the last thing that would hold us up from doing this that I know of we don't see any real issues with the appeals committee that's really a variance for um, setback property setback and uh, the size of the use of the lot that we're doing it in and we don't think there's gonna be any issues with that so all that will be done on this by the 16th we also had a, we've had several meetings with MES because Talbot, Carolina, Queen Anne have an agreement with them, which we met with uh, Mr. Cooper Smith the other day, myself and Ray Clark, and uh, they support what we're doing. They want to change the contract agreement that we have with them to include, and if I say this wrong, Mr. Cooper Smith can correct me, they want to change the contract agreement wording verbiage so that it includes us doing repurposing and then i'm going to go to their november meeting and meet with all three counties 
representatives and explain what we're doing and, and what our plans are. So that should be the last hurdle that, that I know of as far as, you know, coming back to council and getting a vote to approve or not approve. So let me, uh, let me go through the, uh, the dates that I have here in front of me, uh, Warren. Uh, uh, you're on the, you're on the agenda for the planning commission November the 4th, correct? Yes, 9 a.m. And, and, and that's for, is that for the site plan for the setbacks? Um, that's for both. Of them, come, on up, come on up, Mary Kay. Come on up, so, uh, so what? So what's the, the repurposing center's purpose on the November 4th planning commission agenda? They are on the agenda for two items, the site plan approval site by plan. the Planning Commission, as well as the Planning Commission needs to make a recommendation to the Board of Appeals for their special exception use. Okay. Okay. And the Board of Appeals, if they ensure that recommendation be favorable, then you've got to go to the Board of Appeals on November 16th. Yes, Okay. correct. And, get, and give that, their approval on that special exception for that use of that site. Yes. Okay. Um, you have an outstanding contract with this company for your equipment, which is due to end on November the 6th, I believe. It is. And okay. they've agreed to extend it to December the 1st at no extra cost to us. Okay. And they've also agreed to hold until December the 1st the 100% um, fee back to the purchase of the equipment if we do get this passed they'll take every dime that we spent on a rental and put towards the purchase of this equipment okay and uh let me make, make sure i got my day straight here and mr clark we have uh as far as the comprehensive water and sewer plan there's only two times you can make changes to that december being one of which um is it the intention of the public advisory board to include the site uh, uh as a as a revision of the county comprehensive water and sewer plan to the state? Yes. Okay. We would actually have to amend the plan to show that the site is in the sewer service area of the region too. Okay. And, and uh, you plan to take that up in December? The, uh, yes, the, for introduction, we, the comprehensive water sewer plan is amended on the last legislative day in December and it's done each quarter. Okay. I said twice a year, four times a year, I'm yes. sorry. I said twice. Okay, so I uh, got that date straight. And so, Warren, at, at earliest, if, if, I'm, if I'm looking at my calendar, um, it's the 17th of November. It looks like the earliest date we can get you back here. That would allow you to go through the Planning Commission for that consideration, allow you to go to the uh, Board of Appeals the day before on the 16th. Yes. And get you back before us on the, uh, on the 17th uh, for council consideration. And I think the MES is working towards, I think, the 12th or the 14th as well to get us in that window. Okay. And, so and, we and would is, have. And is that just the MES? Is that just them including that language in their, in their agreement, in the MOU with us as a repurposing center? I, I can help. Um, yeah. per, in discussion with MES, we need to have an amendment to the contract that right. includes the per, uh, repurposing facility. Uh, the intent is to try to have something drafted by next week. What we will then try to do is then uh, they're scheduling an administrator's meeting with Dorchester, I'm sorry, with uh, Caroline, Queen Anne's County, and um, Kent County and Talva County uh, th that are the, we're the members of the Mitchell Regional sure. Landfill concept. So they're trying to set that meeting up, I think it's, as Warren said, like the 11th or the 12th of okay, November. you're going to be there to present. Yes. Okay, yes, so sir. then you'll have that in hand also on the 17th. Correct. And, and, and as okay. Warren indicated, we have, to have, yeah, we have to have the other three counties agreeing to this along with right. MES. Okay. So it, it, it looks like the stars are starting to line up here for you, you know. So you got, uh, go ahead and get the planning commission uh, on the November 4th. Uh, MES uh, language redrafted, uh, and then the Board of Appeals decision on the 16th. Uh, that way, when you come back before us on the 17th, we should know all the answers should be, all the questions should be answered. Okay. All right. Um, I would encourage you to read all the letters when you get a chance. I okay. think you got 32 or 33 that I've gotten from state departments 
local government mm -hmm. and contractors local. Yeah. So and look, well, very I'm, encouraging. I'm, I'm, you know, you know, I'm I'm behind you with this thing. I, I just you know we just have to go through the right steps. You know, with planning and with with zoning and with, sure. You know, we have the agreement with MES and, and so forth. Um, so, um, you know, we and, and I certainly appreciate you going back to the vendor and getting them to extend that contract out through these, through, through December um, to allow you to continue uh, processing that that um, the product from uh, from the school. Uh, but yeah, we just got to make sure we get all everything lined up. Uh, so there won't be anyone throwing flags and saying, hey, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. You know, we, we want to abide by the same rules as, as any other private entity. So uh, Understood. Okay. Uh, yes. So um, just to follow up, so a week ago today we had the annual consolidated transportation plan. And I did bring your um, repurposing center up on that call with Tim Smith from the State Highway Administration. And I'm, I'm waiting to get some information from them. He's a materials expert, as uh, his boss told us. Um, he has a lot of experience in this. And I asked him for any kind of roadblocks, stumbling blocks, things that we should look out for, as well as any things that, pointers that he can give us as well. And he's offered to give over some information. So I, I'm looking forward to getting that and sitting down with you and going through this together. Sure. That would definitely be helpful. So, Mr. President, maybe we can get a jump on county manager. Mr. Um, Edwards did want your formal approval about that lease extension at no cost with GT Mid-Atlantic through December 1st, November yes, 6th to December 1st? Yes, sir. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's go right into that. That's a good segue. So, uh, uh, what item was that? Was the, that's the last one, okay? I'll make a motion to approve. There's no additional cost to this. No additional cost. This is approved the extension of the lease contract for the repurposing center. Motion by Mr. Davilio. Second. second. Second by Mr. Lesher. Any further questions of Mr. Edwards while he's here? Hearing none, of secretary, please call your roll. Mr. Pack. Aye. Mr. Davilio. Aye. Mr. Callahan. Aye. Ms. Price. Aye. Mr. Lesher. Aye. Thank you, Warren. Good work. Thank you. Real, real quick, I'm going to leave these bags on the counter in the county manager's office area look at them that's this is from one load of concrete and it's produced five different materials oh, okay. so they explain each bag tells you what it is but it's a big deal thank you thank you thank you He's walking off the bag of rocks <laughs> that's, that's a roads guy for you only only a roads guy would walk around for bag of rocks <laughs> Ice rocks, he said. Very nice. Yeah. <laughs> yes. The Talbot Historical Society is requesting a letter of support from the council for an Eastern Shore Heritage Stories of the Chesapeake Program Grant. There is no county funding involved. Is there a motion? A letter of support? I, I so move. Moved by Mr. Lesher, second by Mr. Callahan. Any further discussion? Here, and I'm going to secretary. Please call your roll. Mr. Pack? Aye. Mr. Davilio? Aye. Mr. Callahan? Aye. Ms. Price? Aye. Mr. Lesher? Aye. Mr. Clark, you ready? So, Council, we're requesting approval to award amendment number one to the bid number 20 3, Engineering Design Services for the Extension of Sewer to Bosman and Nevitt. Awarded to Century Engineering in the amount of $16,250 for the preparation of an environmental report. And it's required by the USDA for the use in their loan. That's correct. Any further comment? No, no other comments. Okay. Uh, Chair, will entertain a, a motion on bid 20 03. Second. Moved by Mr. Callahan. Second. Second by Mr. Lesher. Any further uh, discussion? Madam Secretary, please call your roll. Mr. Pack? Aye. Mr. Davilio? Aye. Mr. Callahan? Aye. Ms. Price? Aye. Mr. Lesher? Aye. Council saying with the same bid, we're looking for approval to award amendment number two to Century Engineering in the amount of $15,200 to design a new website specific to the Bosman Nevitt sewer extension project to keep the citizens informed. Is there a motion on bid number two, say, on, on, on amendment number two, same bid number? So moved. Moved by Mr. Lesher. Second. Second by Mr. Collin. Any further discussion? Yes. Yes. So, so just to clear, so $15,000 is the cost for just the website? Yes, sir. Where's the money coming from? This is actually going to be uh, part of the sanitary district, so this would be paid back by the loan and or grants that we receive for the um, uh, sewer extension. I, I haven't bought a website in a long time, but that seems like 
This, uh, we're actually, this is going through um, the uh, engineering firm Century website. So we're, we're trying to get it so that we're taking uh, the plans, uh, a lot of information that's going to be, uh, we're not hosting this. This is actually being hosted on their, their site. Why can't we just open up a Facebook page? That's where everybody gets it. People, I mean, why? Will this have the GIS links and things this like that? This is going to add that as well. Okay. Okay. We're also going to be having, uh, like, the easement agreements. We're going to have those posted. Uh, the, we're trying to do this also through a communication strategy as well to try and get information to and from uh, the citizens as well as us out to the citizens. Out it, to the citizens. It's yeah. also one of it, I think it's actually a type top item in your office in terms of questions from the public. It is, and we, we, this is a way for us to get the information out right now. Okay, any more questions? We have a motion and a second. Madam Secretary, please call your roll in on amendment number two. Mr. Pack. Aye. Mr. Davilio. Aye. Mr. Callahan. Aye. Ms. Price. Aye. Mr. Lesher. Aye. Thank you, Thank okay. you Council. Uh, next item is requesting your approval to accept a $50,000 hazard mitigation grant from Maryland Emergency Management Agency. Clay, do you want to say anything about that? So this is a grant. Uh, it's a 75-25 matching grant, $50,000 grant. We would actually um, receive $37,500. We would be able to match it with in-kind services. I'm asking for your permission to... Uh, Except this, uh, this will upgrade our five-year hazard mitigation and community resiliency plan. So it would be on not only behalf of the county, but for the towns that partner with us on this project. And uh, so it's, it's uh, we were very fortunate to be recognized for our work on our past plan, and uh, that's why we were prioritized for this grant. Uh, so the request is to accept the grant and to uh, contract with SNS Planning and Design out of Cumberland, Maryland, who. Um, uh, works with us on on this uh, project. Make a motion to accept the grant. Any second? Second it. All right. Any further discussion? Madam Secretary, please call your roll. Mr. Pack. Aye. Mr. Davilio. Aye. Mr. Callahan. Aye. Ms. Price. Aye. Mr. Lusher. Aye. Council regarding board appointments requesting the reappointment of Chip Council to the Planning Commission. Is there a motion? So moved. Second it. Any further discussion? Mr. Council being reappointed. Madam Secretary, please call your roll. Mr. Pack? Aye. Mr. Davilio? Aye. Mr. Callahan? Aye. Ms. Price? Aye. Mr. Lesher? Aye. Ethics Commission requesting the appointment of Barbara Heatley. Is there a motion? To move. move Second. Mr. Moved by Mr. Davilio, uh, Mr. Callahan, second by Mr. Davilio. And Ms. Heatley on to the Ethics Commission. If there's no further discussion, Madam Secretary, call your roll. Mr. Pack? Aye. Mr. Davilio? Aye. Mr. Callahan? Aye. Ms. Price? Aye. Mr. Lesher? Aye. And finally, Local Emergency Planning Committee, the Town of Trap is requesting the appointment of Norm Fagel. So moved. Second it. Okay. Any further discussion on Norm Fagel to be on the Local Emergency Planning Commission for the Town of Trap? Hearing none, Madam Secretary, please call your roll. Mr. Pack? Aye. Mr. Davilio? Aye. Mr. Callahan? Aye. Ms. Price? Aye. Ms. Mr. Lesher? Aye. Council requesting you to move your November 24th meeting to November 17th and take a motion to declare it a special legislative day. Is there a motion to uh, move the meeting to November 17th? So as moved. Stated? Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Secretary, please call your roll. Mr. Pack? Aye. Mr. Davilio? Aye. Mr. Callahan? Aye. Ms. Price? Aye. Mr. Lesher? Aye. County offices will be closed on Tuesday, November 3rd in recognition of Election Day. And the meeting with the local delegation this year has been rescheduled for Monday, November 9th, 5 p.m., Y Oak Room in the Talbot County Community Center. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Hollis. Council comment? Mr. Davilio? Uh, so I would just like to say that um, my children obviously mean the, the world to me. We just wrapped up a, a youth soccer league out to the YMCA. And I'd like to thank the YMCA for, one, making it a, a safe event. Uh, you know, you had to wear masks to get out there. They limited the number of the kids on the field, which then limited the number of parents on the sidelines. And it gave the kids an, an, an outlet to get out, exercise, and socialize. Uh, 
And youth sports, recreational sports, have always been very important in my life. When I stood on the sidelines and looked at the, the children playing and the, and the parents around it, uh, it's the most diversified group of individuals I've seen in Talbot County when you go to a recreational sports event. And it, it really was nice to see the kids getting along, the parents getting along, and everyone being safe. So I'd like to thank the YMCA for being one of those organizations that whether they recognize it or not, uh, they're doing a tremendous job of bringing the community together and allowing us all to see that we are a community. Thank you. I inadvertently skipped over the public comment portion, so I do apologize. So we'll, we'll spin back to council comment after we hear, hear from the public. Mr. Okay, we have Aaron. two uh, people connected to the WebEx service. Okay. Um, if you're interested in speaking in the public comment, please press star three on your phone or the raise hand button on the computer. No, okay. So let's continue on with council comment. Mr. Lesher, you have anything? Take responsibility, get out there and vote. Short and sweet and to the point. Ms. Price, you have anything? Ditto, Mr. Lesher. Ms. Callahan, welcome back. Do you have anything? Nope, I'm good, vote. Excellent. <laughs> Okay, council, uh, county council's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, November the 10th, uh, beginning at 6 p.m. here in the Bradley meeting room. The council will be convening an open session at 4.30 p.m. and immediately adjourning to closed session to discuss real estate, legal, and personal, personnel matters as listed for the statement for closing the meeting. Madam Secretary, any further information on the agenda? No? Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you.